It's kind of a different thing. Uh, much like Melody's uh, session, I guess you would call it, with Pat Conaway, uh, showing her how to use, um, I think it was Flipgrid they were talking about. Um, I'm going to make this basically Madeline Catherine oriented because uh, this was all about giving them a chance to ask me. Oh, no, that's, that's the wrong way. That's, you do that for the British, that's really rude. Um, <clears throat> uh, so it's, it's for them. They wanted to ask me a bunch of questions. And when there's extra time, you all can ask me a whole bunch of other questions. Another person who I thought was going to be here was Charles Waterman, but he's not here. Hey, too bad. But um, I hope uh, for those of you who have not ever heard me talk about this, that you've seen some of the videos that um, I, I put up on the event and maybe even my presentation from the summer sessions, because that'll help you fill in a lot of the blanks. Uh, or it, it'll give you at least a palette and there'll still be a lot of blanks there and then we can fill them in as we go along tonight. But um, welcome everyone and let's get started. Catherine, um, Madeline, what are your big, uh, big questions on the deck? <laughs> Um, is this whole deck for the one semester or is it um, just like the first 10 classes or what I was wondering, is this your whole course? First if you're all? talking about what about you volume, if you're talking about what you might have downloaded from um, uh, my Google Drive, that's not even something that I would use in a classroom with a lot of purpose. Uh, what I wanted to do that for was to show uh, I had been working with Alex Burke to make uh, uh, show everybody what uh, we're talking about here. Okay, so share and come back here. Um, here's what this looks like. And I, would, I had been working with Alex Burke to create um, some neuro friendly, uh, neurodiverse friendly um, um, backgrounds and colors uh, for kids who might be autistic or ADHD. And she was telling me dark backgrounds with light lettering, um, try to use this type of font and that type of spacing. And so I came up with this, but I have not yet completely taken my SCVC curriculum and moved it completely to any kind of synchronous version because I've only had one semester to do this. And in the first semester, I was like everybody else. I was like a chicken with its head cut off running around and wasn't quite sure how to implement everything. Oh, there's Alex. Uh, implement everything the way I would normally in a classroom. So don't look at this as if it was supposed to fill out a 15 week schedule. Um, what I want to do is give everybody an idea about what I generally do. And then tonight, perhaps verbally tell you where I usually go from the first class all the way up to let's say the 13th uh, class in terms of getting, giving the kids time to get the skills necessary for them in but the 14th class is the practice class. The 15th and the 16th classes are test classes. So what you might've downloaded Madeline isn't any kind of an indication of what I would do through an entire semester. I have a 67 card stack in Keynote. Yep, that's right, that's the one. Yeah, that's okay. the one. Um, and um, it's mostly just, a, it was a prototype to use um, Keynote because normally I, I do this all on a blackboard. Sure. Um, I, I do this like this, right? I, I feel most comfortable actually with chalk in my hand. And I've taken a lot of photographs of my blackboards, but um, it evolved from my need to show this to people at presentations. And then, which then, you know, and that evolved into um, the need to actually do this in the classroom as well too. So yeah, that's not supposed to be anything that's like a curriculum, um, a curriculum schedule, but I would like to be able to do that because eventually I would like to somehow publish all of this, give this out to people who might not uh, be on OTJ that I don't present to directly. Well, I mean, it definitely follows a progression through. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, is this a progression you go through? If, so I already see. have, yeah. Go, go, go. No, Sorry, I'm I already have, you know, my, my, my syllabus is set and my textbook is set and everything, but I would love to jump in and add some of these. I know you were talking about somebody who used some of them, another person who used them as warm-ups or something, or, used, or has devoted a certain amount of time to this. Um, it looks like a lot of my classes are going to be, they're going to force me to do asynchronous, really. Um, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. with the few students who do come, I thought maybe we would do something like this and give them... Um, 
you know, because the other work is all going to be synchronous, I mean, asynchronous. So the ones who come to class on time, not on time, in, in, in class during the time period, it might be fun to try something like this. So you're going to be in a hybrid class then? Um, yeah, well, I'm going to be at home. But apparently a lot of their classes are on campus. And so some of the students are going to be in transit when they're supposed to be attending my class. And wow. a lot of the students who, most of my students were at home with Wi-Fi, and now they're going to be in their apartments on data. And it's going to be a lot harder to hold the 90 minute Zoom class anymore. Um, so which some is of what your I kids... Did, no, that's oh. what I did first semester was 90 minute, made basically 90 minute Zoom classes. Um, so some of your kids are going to be on the bus while you're doing class. Yes. Yes. Or on oh, the train. Oh man, that's going to be tough. Or, okay. Well, so, we'll talk. We'll talk yeah. about that later, or maybe more next week, because next week is going to be that event that I um, started um, concocting yesterday for um, getting a discussion going about what to do in a hybrid class, and I think you're going to be in a, a similar sort of situation. Yes, uh, just, so uh, maybe Catherine has a. Yeah, question. Catherine. What did you want to ask? Hello. I guess so. My situation is so very, very different. I want to implement this in my face-to-face -face junior high school mm -hmm. classes. Mm -hmm. So I see the students for um, one period a week. They have what's called oral, oral mm -hmm. English. I'm the only teacher in the class. I am free to do anything I want in that time period. They have a textbook that they use in their other English classes. And generally in the oral English time, I practice using the language they have learned. <laughs> what are their TOEIC scores like? This is junior high school. Junior high, so I don't have any yet. Of I don't what? think anyone's ever taken TOEIC. Where would they be in ACAN if they took ACAN? If they took ACAN, I mean, because I teach the entire, I mean, I have they're all together so they're not separated by levels at all so I'm sure I have students who have passed um, level three some have maybe passed pre two or going for pre two this will still work this will still work um, you'll in a such a situation I've never encountered it but um, when I was working with lower level junior college and university kids and Mary can back me up on this. It still works, but you just have to um, bring in lots of vocabulary. You have to make the actual drills themselves very specific with lots of demonstrations. It'll still work. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm totally convinced it can and will work. I'm just thinking how I will adapt it to work. So okay. I was thinking, I don't know. I was thinking maybe there anybody else I always feel like I'm in a situation that nobody else has ever. <laughs> no. no. Um, one of the t-shirts oh, that, uh, yeah, yeah. t that have been submitted for design actually says, OTJ, you are not alone, which I thought was, was a really nice <laughs> actually, design, actually, because yeah. it's, it's a nice sentiment. Um, that is. Yeah, so uh, Mary, Mary um, there's a couple other two Marys here. Uh, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's Mary, always a Mary few. Uchida, Mary Uchida. There's always a few. Hokkaido Mary. How, how, how have you been doing this? Because I, I heard that you were doing this with your junior high students. Actually, I've been doing it with even elementary. Okay. Yeah, so it, it can be adjusted. Mm -hmm. And they actually really love it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, go for it. <laughs> It's um, when, I, when I give this to my university students and some of the more um, courageous and honest ones who obviously enjoyed what I was doing will come up to me. Some of them will say things like, this is what I wanted to do all along in English class, which is to actually just say something, but not be asked to say something that's very difficult, that would risk losing face, um, and give them a chance to say something in the sense of practicing what it is that is being asked of them. A lot of the times they get asked to say something that's like a really long sentence or they're asked to read a loud uh, paragraph with words that they don't know how to pronounce. So they stumble and they falter and it's a little bit um, dispiriting. But with this, um, one of the things that I like to talk about is something called the no fail scenario. So you start off from a point like here, I'll start the screen share again. Start off from a point where there is absolutely no way absolutely none. I mean, unless you're a bad teacher, that the kids could actually fail 
at what it is that you're asking them to do. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to um, make a new version of this because I've added a lot of slides at the end of this. And um, I'm going to uh, make this available for download after we're finished and it'll be up uh, where the event was. So from the event, there'll be a link to Google Drive and from Google Drive, you can download this either as um, Keynote or uh, as PowerPoint. A little later, I'd like Alex to kind of comment on um, what she thinks of the colors and stuff like that. But there's no way that you, you should allow your students to go to the next step or to the next scaffolded level when you as an instructor think that they might fail. If they fail, remember there was probably because you failed in demonstration or instruction. But the easiest way to fix it is just to make them do it again and to think about what didn't I demonstrate, what didn't I show, and specifically target that. A lot of this also involves a different attitude on your part, that you're not an information instructor. You're not, you're not delivering bucket loads of information. It's asking you to be more of a sports coach, uh, somebody who's looking at the skills to do something that is not necessarily difficult or, or uh, you know, particularly hard to comprehend. Uh, the, uh, the analogy that I give is that if you tell somebody um, in a baseball game, the very first time they ever pick up a bat, what the bat is for you. Them, okay, you see this bat and you see that ball, he's going to throw it at you, hit it. That's it. That's pretty much everything to hitting in terms of a basic description. But in terms of becoming good at it, it takes hours and hours and hours in practice and, and thousands or tens upon thousands of swings. And that's not something that we're, that we as instructors are actually prone to doing a lot with these kids. We tend to ask them, okay, well, here's the relative pronoun. Now, this is what you put the them and what and which, that and where. Okay, now let's move on to the past relative pronoun. And very, very quickly, these kids get drowned in information that they haven't yet practiced. So with the no-fail scenario, you give them something very basic. You could even go from something like the first um, um, the first pronoun, the first seven pronouns, I, you, he, she, it is we, they, and not pair it with a verb. And instead, just do the pronouns on their own. And the way that I, uh, can I ask with a show of hands, I'm going to kill my share here, uh, with a show of hands, I think almost everybody's on screen. Okay. Um, in your, um, in your uh, participants list, you'll see the, uh, the hand raise button. Raise your hand if you've seen video of me um, doing the demonstration class for my YouTube playlist. Raise hand. So a few people haven't yet. Okay, so I'm gonna demonstrate this a little bit. Uh, I really do encourage you to go and watch that playlist because a lot of what I'm talking about is hard to comprehend until you actually see it. But you're just doing it in the reverse order. You're hearing me talk about it first and then you're actually gonna go see the demonstration. But for example, Mary, you're my guinea pig tonight. So let's pretend that Mary is one of the students and I'll say, okay, Miss Virgil Uchida, you're going to do a demonstration with me. You okay? Now take a look at the demonstration card, okay? You see that? I, you, he, she, it, we, they. Do you have any questions? No, I'm fine. Okay, so this is how we're gonna do this. I'm gonna say the first pronoun you're gonna say the next one in order. Then I'll say the next one in order. When we get down to they, we go back to I and we keep going until I say stop, okay? Okay. I. You. He. She. It. We. They. I. You. He. She. It. We. They. I. You. <laughs> and eventually at a certain point, you start putting up the pressure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And most students, and even Mary kind of succumbed to it, didn't want to put the pressure on me. But then you, you tell people, uh, it's okay, you know, if you want to try to put the pressure on each other, because that's actually what you're missing in a lot of these speaking practices. You don't feel the pressure of dealing with conversation as it should be spoken. As it should be spoken, it should be high speed. It should be high pace. Um, the gap between your question and the next answer, in most cases, has very little, little gap. If I want to say, hi, how are you? Fine, thanks should be that small a gap. Unless you're, you're dealing with a very, very deep question of the presentation, shouldn't be a gap of any more than half a second. But with most of these kids, because we think we're being very kind to them, we give them all kinds of gap time to play with. Then they get used to it. Oh, well, here they're being reset. They're being told to like really go for it. So let's say, um, let's see, uh, Steve, Steve Hanaberry. Now I do, if I feel like 
um, this is brand new and I should make sure that these kids and I don't really know where their skills are. I do two demonstrations. Okay. So Steve, you ready? Same thing. Sure. I. You. He. She. We, uh, it. It. Uh, they. Oh, geez. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> You're not screen sharing me. anymore. I'm, like, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, sorry. I completely forgot. Okay. <laughs> Bad teacher. Bad teacher. Bad teacher. Okay. Let's start again. Okay. Okay. I. You. He. She. It. We. They. I. You. He. She. It. We. They. Good. Now from here, I'm not going to do it because it kills time. I would put you in breakout rooms. The instructions specifically are do not introduce yourselves. Okay. Uh, do not spend any time speaking. The first person in the room, because someone's going to be first, even by a microsecond, is going to be the first person who speaks. Okay? That's good. Through the first couple of classes, the first weeks or so, I do jump in and out of the breakout rooms to encourage them to speak. And I make my presence known. I don't go sneaking in there. I say, hey, everybody. Hey, nobody's talking. Come on, let's go. Okay, got to go to the next room. See ya. And do it all very positively and not, not try to be negative about the fact, you know, you catch somebody not speaking. Could be just hesitation. Could be shyness. It is the first week, the second week and such. And you just try to keep very, very positive about it and jump in and out. And eventually you're going to feel the need because you see sometimes it's a kid who's particularly lazy or a kid is kind of goofing off. And yeah, you have to lay down a law a bit, but eventually you're going to start knowing just like, you know, um, what is it? Pavlov's bell that um, if they're in a class, I could be popping in any second and they have to be kind of on their toes by the end of the 10th week or so, when I put them in breakout rooms and every time I went in, they were doing it no matter what the exercise was. Okay. And from there, you could go back to this. You can move these slides in any order. That's why I give them to you as original slides, not just as PDFs. Um, and here's another one for you. Here's a, a different one. Uh, let's see. Let's do this with Catherine this time. So here's the explanation. I want you to do two pronouns at a time. Okay. Which means that when you get down to they, you have to match it to the next pronoun in order, which is I. Okay, Catherine? Okay. Okay. I, you. He, she. It, we. They, I. You, he. She, it. We, they. I, you. He, she. It, we. They, I. You, he. Okay. <laughs> start, start, to, start to build up in your head. You can also use this uh, because it still uses only the seven pronoun list as the warm up for the second week or the warm up for the third week. And it still works because um, you're, you're twisting their brains around and the emphasis is still on speed and, uh, and uh, high, high, quick responses. Um, uh, Madeline. You're muted. <laughs> In breakout rooms, are, do they have this to see? Yeah. Now, I've forgotten. Um, you make them copy it down or write it down or give it to somebody in the breakout room before they go in? You or? could do it two ways. Um, you, uh, I noticed, I, I didn't realize it, but uh, some of my classes, they were relatively low level. And even with my higher level class, because they were a little bit shy and, and wanting to, of course, not make any mistakes, were writing this down. So they took their notes with them. And the problem was that this is not something that I encourage in a classroom. In a classroom, mm -hmm. there's only one place that it's written because I don't let them walk around with pens and... Um, pens and paper. It's only on the blackboard, but I also encourage them to oh, look if you want to, but if you're going to look, then you're looking. When you're speaking, get away from the paper and go back up to the camera and look at the other person. And then you can start doing that. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's important to encourage them to say that get your brain going to the point where when your mouth moves, your eyes should be trying to make contact with another human being. In this case, it's a camera. Now it's harder in a classroom because they do have their paper with them. But for some lower level students, it's necessary. So what I'm gonna to try to do this semester is make a Google version of this and Google Slides that they can all access so that then it's on their browser while they're on Zoom. And then they can see it whenever they go into a breakout room, it's still there. So then at least they don't have to look down on a piece of paper. It's just an eye flick over to wherever. And then it should work. But I still like what I normally do in a classroom, which is I tell them, it's over there on the blackboard, look if you want to look, but come back over here to talk. Thank you. Hmm. Catherine, is um, that okay so far? 
Yes, I mean, as I'll be in a physical classroom, I would, I would just have it written on the board. So. Then you move on uh, with different verbs. And then from here, um, you want to do this so that then they feel like the, the original order of ayu, he, she, we, they should be burned into their frontal lobes. So there's no way that they can mix that up unless they're being lazy or um, I don't know what the problem might be, but most of them, like a good 70% of them will have pretty much got it into working memory and maybe even to, pardon me, long-term memory. And then you emphasize this conjugation form, oops, this conjugation form of the S sound in the present simple, uh, because that's something that a lot of them, you know this, uh, that uh, they just can't master. They still say, he go, my father go to work. And um, it's something that I encourage them to remember, but I also tell them that um, this is a problem my third year, my fourth year students still have. So the more you focus on it now, the better you're going to get when you get up to the next level. But it, you can also make it like, um, you tell them this is important, it's on the test. Literally, if I hear you say this on the test, you will lose points. And you tell them, oh, it's on the test. And they start you know, sharpening their ears a little bit. You do this like I do, you do, he does, she does. So let's say, uh, Mike, Mike Lyons, you wanna try this with me? Absolutely. Okay, but let's, uh, let's, um, let's see. What's next? Now, you know what? I'm going to make this so that... More difficult. A <laughs> little bit. Yeah, a little bit more difficult. Um, where can I grab... There's one. Okay. I'm going to grab this. I'm going to go back to do. Okay. So let's put an object in there. Okay? Okay. You mean I do Ikebana? Oh, I do Ikebana, and you do Ikebana, and he does Ikebana. Yeah. Okay. okay. I do Ikebana. You do Ikebana. He does Ikebana. He does Ikebana. It does Ikebana. We do Ikebana. They do Ikebana. I do Ikebana. And um, as a warm-up to the question of, uh, do you do Ikebana? Hmm. Which these kids will look at, and they go, why are you using do twice? I kind of understand, but re oh yeah, you do use do twice. This is the non-question form statement that is used later on when we're practicing the question. And I explained to them, for Ikebana, it's actually do. For karate, it's actually do. But Mr. Cruz, karate is a sport. Yes, but it's a foreign loan word in English, and it's also a martial art. So you don't say, I play Karate, you don't say I play judo, you say I do judo or I do karate. Then when you bring it to the question, um, they're at least familiar with it. So a lot of the stuff that you want to do as questions later on, you can bring here. Another one that I like to do, um, I don't have it here, but uh, for example, if we take this. Uh, Mary, Aruga, shall we try this? Okay. Okay. I'm Japanese. You are Japanese. He's Japanese. He's Japanese. No, I said he's Japanese. Oh, he, she is Japanese. It's Japanese. <laughs> we are Japanese. They are Japanese. I am Japanese. You are Japanese. He is Japanese. He is Japanese. It's Japanese. Good, okay. Felt a little pressure, did you? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. I, I tell them, did you notice that, um, or, Usually, my university students will, if I put in just a little pressure, if I bring it up just by a microsecond, they're going to start to trip up, um, even if they were perfect on the first cycle. And I point out to them, you see, this isn't a problem of you not understanding the information because you were perfect on the first cycle. But if I speed up anywhere close to the way that I would speak quickly if I was in a real conversation, especially a very fun conversation or a heated conversation, you wouldn't be able to keep up with it on so many levels, but primarily because you've never spoken that quickly and you've never heard people speak that quickly at you. Um, Madeline. When do you do conjunctions? So I am, I'm your, he's, she's, it's... Oh, you mean we are uh, there? Not because conjunctions, collocations. Col not collocation, not collocations. Um, conjunctions. Contractions. 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 That's what I mean. Yes. Contractions. I'm an English teacher. Yes. You you can bring them. In, you can bring them anytime you feel comfortable, Madeline. A lot of this is um, 
adjusted depending on how high level your students are. Right, right, right. A lot of what you're looking at right now is warming up. Now, if you've got some pretty good kids who might be, let's say, at TOEIC 650 already or TOEIC 600 that you're prone to find at national universities with some classes, then you would do this just as a warm up. And the stuff that I'm going to show you in about 20 minutes or so, you would try to go deep into that as quickly as you could in the weekly schedule as well as in that classes um, schedule. Right. So you had said that you don't progress until they've mastered that level. Um, what's your, how do you, how do you determine that they've mastered it and ready to move on? I watch them like a good coach because some days the kids that you thought were doing really well the day before, maybe, I don't know, uh, their favorite actor died and the whole half of them is really depressed and they're really kind of slow or they had to walk through a typhoon to get to school and, or whatever. And maybe today they're not doing that well, which means that they haven't got quite to the level of mastery, which means that um, depending on when you're sad or depressed or pissed off, you can still speak quickly. But I watch them and, um, and I think to myself, are they having a good day or ha are they having a bad day? You listen for their speed. You listen for their stumbles. You listen for the level of Japanese that they need to communicate with each other about what they're trying to say or what partner A is trying to help partner B with in terms of the assignment, not assignment, the, the actual, uh, well, the thing that they have to do. So you, you have to not look at this in terms of um, a numerical target or a simple target. You have to watch them. And, um, and um, just, like a good, uh, like, just like a good sports coach. Now mastery itself, when I say mastery, that's a very, very loosely defined word. In, in those terms that I used it before, it meant, can we go on to the next level without me fearing that they might fall on their faces? I mean, uh, eventually in six months after they finish my class, they're probably gonna forget a lot of this. So it's, maybe it's not absolute mastery. It's only in their working memory. But in terms of um, a successful class, as long as they can get to the next level without failing and everyone's having a good time, then yeah, I would call that, you know, quotation marks mastery. And when they're in the Zoom rooms, you're checking that by popping in or do you have them come out and do a few in front of the class? I can't, I don't know how, um, how in you're terms of In terms of checking how they're doing, um, the online synchronous world is just as new to me as it is to you. Um, we don't have breakout rooms in my face-to-face -face classroom and I can watch them all the time. Sure. But when they're in breakout rooms, um, yeah, they're on their own, but when they come back out, you can generally, maybe it's because I've been doing it for a while, but you can generally tell if they've been like, they've been having a good time and they were like laughing and they were kind of still giggling when they come out and, and they're, they're still talking when they come out and stuff like that. You can feel the energy as they come out of the breakout rooms. If they look depressed, if they're all looking down, it looks like they're, they don't, don't really know what's going on. They were probably not talking. So you, you try to revive that spirit. Uh, by doing different things, or maybe moving on to the textbook work. Maybe today isn't a good day for SCVC uh, kind of thing. Right. Mary. Um, just back to when do you go into the conjunctions, is it? <laughs> no, I've forgotten. Contractions. Contractions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the thing I found that was so nice is, um, you know, I am, I am, you are, he is, she is. At that level, by doing it so fast around a group, so they the naturally of that I, I, he is you, is you, you know, and be, it, because of the rhythm, he is you, he is you. Wait, wait, it really disappeared. Yeah. And ah. with the conjunctions and uh, so he's a, he's a, so it, they won't put the I in every time. Yeah. So I, it helped get rid of all of that. And so don't just jump right into con the conjunctions. Yeah, I wouldn't either. <laughs> Mostly because you're going to see in the next structure, the question practice, that it's important for them to understand what is the pronoun and what is the verb. If it's taught only as a unit and you don't say specifically, this is a pronoun and this is a verb, and then this is a contraction. I actually don't practice contractions, I realize now, until about week four. And I'm not doing any contractions at all until after I get past questions. So that then I can show them that uh, I am becomes am I. And you see, it's just a switch. But if you taught them immediately contractions, and let's say some kid didn't show up to the first class and they know only contractions, they go, what is that am I? Well, literally, some university kids have never seen I am. Amazing, right? 
but uh, I know some kids that don't. So those are the basic, um, oh, and also another one that you could do here, here. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm just gonna add to this, okay. So we we'll go to the negative um, and, whoops, actually no, you know what? Because I know Bill isn't, <laughs> Bill White. Okay. Ready to go? Okay, I'll try. I am not Canadian. You are not Canadian. He is not Canadian. He is not Canadian. It is not, it is not Canadian. We are not Canadian. They are not Canadian. I'm not Canadian. You are not Canadian. He's not Canadian. She's not Canadian. It, it, it isn't Canadian. It's good. It is not Canadian. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. And don't be afraid to flub because actually it leads to the point where you can tell them, it's not because I don't understand. Trust me, I understand this grammar, but trying to do it fast with you, even I can flub. So when you flub, it's not because you're stupid. It's just because even me, look at me. I know I have the skill to do this. If I really concentrated, I can still make a mistake. Suzuki Ichiro only batted 320. You know what they meant? What that means for the other 680 times he batted? You know? um, let's see. Let's, so Catherine. So I was noticing as that you and Bill were doing it about that you were using the contracted form. Like sort of naturally, as, I, as, I, as that's how we naturally speak. And then I think it was when Bill came, it's in like where the contraction yeah, that's actually why I don't want them do, to do it until like week four. You're that's saying or right, like until you've already had. There's an old explanation, especially with the be verb, about where mm -hmm. you contract. Yeah. Uh, with the do verb, uh, in the negative, there's only one place to contract. Right. And um, that whole explanation, I also tell them that um, if you try to contract and you haven't mastered it, and then you're in a communication situation, it's actually easier to understand you when you say, I am not. Okay. Then I suppose to I'm not because you know that the tendency to not snap their T's, it's hard for a Japanese person to snap their T's mm -hmm. and um, they make a very silent can't and you can't tell if it's a can or if it's a can't. Mm -hmm. So I tell them, keep them separate, make them understood. But there's also a separate lecture when I tell them, but eventually you have to learn those contractions. But right now for this class, for the purposes of this class, I just want you to not use them, but eventually you're going to have to learn them. They come to my higher level class, you will have to use them. I'll correct you if you don't. Okay, so on to the question form, which is a big leap uh, for SCVC. <clears throat> so you just take um, a basic irregular verb like do or can or be, and you take the subject and your verb and you switch it around, which is actually a pretty crazy way to make a, a question, um, especially in English. It's, um, it's crazy how English does it. Uh, Mallory actually realizes probably that French is probably even simpler because there are only so many verbs that you need to actually make French questions. But in English, it's even crazier with do. But this is the way that I practice it. So just imagine all of the pronouns um, switched over to the question form. I am becomes am I, you are becomes are you. But to make it a little bit more conversational, to make it so that then it's actually a little bit more fun. And except for the parts of I am and you are, the, the question answer form actually does make a little bit of sense, makes more sense than just going, I am, am I, you are, are you, he is, is he. This is the way that I do it. If you follow that arrow, it goes, I am, as the very beginning, whoever starts, starts at the same point, I am. But now I want a question added on to that person's um, speaking set, not just a statement, but a question to accompany it. And in this case, the question is created by using the subject next in order from the subject that was used in the statement. It's a lot harder to understand when it's spoken at you than it is to actually do it. But I is the statement subject. So the question for following that statement is uses the um, uh, subject you because you is next to I. When that is asked, so partner A says this, this is partner B's answer. Partner B answers with the same subject that was in the question. It becomes you are. But then what's next after you? It's he. So it's you are is he. And I, do I have the third one? No, I don't. Okay. You are is he. 
And then if it is, is he, then the answer is he is. Okay. So if you want, you can turn off your microphone or you leave your microphone on, but I'm going to be partner A and all the rest of you are going to be partner B. Okay. Let's just do this slowly together. Okay. Here we go. I am. Are you? So your answer should have been you are is he. Okay. okay. So you said you are is he. Here, here I go. He is. Is she? She is. Is he? Is it? It is. Are we? We are. Are we? They. They are. Am I? I am. I am. Are you? Are you? You are. Is he? He, he is. Is she? She is. Is it? It is. Are we? There you go. Yeah. There you go. Was that Mike? Uh, Andy. Oh, Andy. Okay. Let's keep going. Uh -oh. Okay. Okay. Here we go. We are. Are they? They are. Am I? Oh, no, just Andy. Just Andy. <laughs> just Andy. Just Andy. Just <laughs> Andy. Okay. We are. Are they? Andy. They are. Am I? Am I? I? I am. Are you? You are. Is he? He is. Is she? She is. Is it? It is. Are we? We are. Are they? Good. <laughs> <laughs> I could hear that uh, right at the very end. How, how was that, Andy? Oh, my camera's not working. Um, that was, yeah, fun. Yeah, uh, it got, yeah, like you said, a little more stressful. It's a higher pace, but yeah. You will so also I imagine other students in the class like laughing and having it be like a fun moment. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, you also have to be careful about with whom you demonstrate. Uh, mm. Before in the classroom, I had an entire system to make sure that whoever would demonstrate with me wanted to demonstrate with me. I would sure. make sure that unless it was a very small class, in a 90-minute class, I would have a, probably about 20 to 23 demonstrations. And to make sure that it, it, only, only the people that really want to demonstrate two times would have that opportunity or would need to. Because... If you demonstrate with somebody who doesn't want to demonstrate, you're going to have horrible demonstrations. So I have to have a lot of buy-in. And um, I'm thinking about how to do that in synchronous classes. But what I did in my, um, my, uh, my live classes, these kids rotate. I don't know why Charles Waterman isn't here, but um, he's the one that outguessed how I do my classroom rotations. They move like a snake through my classroom. And I stay in one position I stay in one position and eventually the student that comes to me right here knows that it's his turn. And I tell them that if you sit in this kind of order, you'll eventually come here, you'll do a demonstration with me and those will count as participation points for your grade. So they start going, oh shit, participation points, that's easy. All I have to do is sit there and just demonstrate with them. And, um, and I don't even have to be correct. I tell them, I don't care if you're correct or if you flub or not. It's just that I want you to be there. You don't want to be there. You sit over here and I'm probably not going to get to you. And, uh, and you end up with kids who want to be there. Kid, and you even tell them, okay, you want the easiest demonstrations? Then start from here. You want the harder ones? Start a few seats back. You want the really hard ones? That's probably about the 18th change or the 19th change. So sit around here. If you've got a sore throat, you don't feel like it today, you've got a headache, sit around the 19th chair or the 23rd chair. I'm probably not going to get to you. However, do remember that participation points make up whatever amount your syllabus asks them to be. And if you never sit in the demonstration chair, I can guarantee you, you will not get anything better than a C. And you're in high chance of getting a D because you just, for some reason, forsook all of those 25, 30% that you could have gotten just by sitting in this chair five or six times during 15 weeks. And um, they, uh, they seem to enjoy it too. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of fun. Uh, sometimes kids really, really enjoy themselves. Maybe later I can show you some videos of the kids in my videos who really went with it, really ran with the ball of having some fun with some of the um, goofier assignments that I made them do. This then becomes the next verb in line because not just be verb, but also do. Okay, you can do this in the past tense. You can do this in the, if you want to do future tense, uh, I will do, will you do, you will do, will he do, he will do, will she do, she will do, will it do, it will do, will we do, that kind of thing. Um, demonstrating also the first demonstrations, try not to flub. You have to look like a voice of authority. 
And if you flub too many of your primary demonstrations, they're going to start looking, wait a minute, if he can't do it well, why does he expect us to do it well? You can flub a little bit later, but just not on the first couple of weeks. And this is me uh, demonstrating this to some of my students. I think this will start. Yeah, I'm on share. Oh, wait, I um, completely forgot to hit my audio buttons. Sorry. Let's start that again. Okay, here we go. I have a very crazy way of doing this practice. Now, this is with go. Person starts at I go. When you make the question, you make it with the subject next in order. So if your answer was I go, your question will use you. I go, do you go? Your answer to this question uses the same subject which then takes the next subject. This question uses this answer, which then takes the next subject, and so on and so on. It looks hard, but actually, once you start doing it, it starts getting pretty easy. Well, let's take this slowly. Do you have any questions, dear? No. OK, so I'll go slowly. I go, do you go? Hmm? I go, do you go? Uh, you go, does he go? Good. He goes, does she go? She goes, do we go? Yeah. Next one after she. Uh, does it go? It goes, do we go? We go, do they go? They go, do I go? I, you go. Mm -hmm. um, they go, do I go? I go, do you go? You go, does he go? He goes. Very good. Do your best. Ready? Go. Let's give you some context. Oops, I gotta stop this. Let's give you some context. That um, classroom was put together uh, to create a demonstration video specifically of my of my method. And the kids that we had assembled were ranging from around TOEIC 550 to TOEIC 650. That particular girl that I just did a demonstration with, she was around a TOEIC 620 and had just come back from Britain in a homestay. And she was having trouble with this because it's just not something that you practice a lot. And she was already relatively fluent, but you could tell that when she would ask questions, she, would, she wouldn't say something like, um, do you like sports? She would probably, like a lot of our students say, you like sports? Be just because you're, it's that tactic to avoid that question grammar, because it's so hard to say quickly. So this is the sort of thing that a lot of them actually uh, appreciate. A question on that, Catherine, Madeline, anyone? So when you start, I mean, your whole class is fluency and the end goal is to speak faster? Faster, okay. <laughs> Higher speed, smoother pace. Those are two different um, facets of fluency. But also you want them to have faster answers faster idea production. So not just in terms of faster word utterance, in terms, of, in terms of everything that you do in a conversation, everything has to be faster. You have to make your ideas faster. You have to answer faster. Um, you have to be able to match your physical gestures with the speed that which, at which you're speaking. And the speed at which you're speaking, when you try to ramp that up, your, your brain is on fire trying to handle all of this new neural load. And you, you, it's hard to actually think about gestures and things because you're concentrating on something very different and something that you've never done before, which is to speak really, really quickly. It's not just speaking quickly. There's a whole bunch of other stuff on top of it, but I'll boil it down. F faster speed, okay, smoother pace. And s the, the pace control is a different set of practices. But first, you have to have speed in the short utterances 
move that over to longer utterances, maintain the speed, and then show how to control your breathing, how to control your thought processes, so that you can maintain that over a sentence that might span over 25 or 30 words, depending on what it is that you actually want to say, so that you don't have to stop until you actually want to. Something that we know how to do in our native language and something that I know I can't do that in Japanese. It's really hard for me to do that unless I really concentrate. And these kids cannot do in English because they've never been trained to do it, no matter how low level the words are. And we listen to the recording of what I just said, very, very low level words, but I said them in a way that was fluent without any gaps in between. That's completely different to um, neural load, right? That's fluency, higher speed, smoother pace. Okay, <clears throat> let's see what's next on the thing that I can show here. That was the video. Okay, there it was. I go, do you go? You go, does he go? Who haven't I done this with? Mallory, you want to try? Why not? <laughs> by the way, a lot of this was inspired by what I had to learn in junior high school French. Really? Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, je vais, tu va, tu va, je vais, tu va, il va, il, il va, elle va. Elle va. Nous allons, vous allez, vous allez, but I put on the added twist of putting the question plus the subject um, slide mm -hmm. down to the bottom. So this would very, very quickly move into French, very easily. Okay. Okay, here we go. Ready? Yes. I go, do you go? You go, does he go? He goes, does she go? She goes, does it go? It goes, do we go? We go, do they go? They go, do I go? Uh, I go, do you go? Good. And uh, <laughs> Alex, let's put to school on that. Whoops. Alex is there, isn't she? She's not frozen. Is she? Oh, so she's there. <laughs> Just need you to unmute, Alex. Or shall I unmute you? There you go. Still okay. muted. Hey. <laughs> no, no, not anymore. Okay. Okay. So to school, okay? Uh -huh. Okay. I go to school. Do you go to school? You go to, you go to school. Does he go to school? He goes to school. Does she go to school? She goes to school. Does it go to school? It goes to school. Do we go to school? We go to school. Does it, uh, do they go to school? They go to school. Do I go to school? I go to school. Do you go to school? Good. Where a lot of these kids, uh, thank you, will uh, try to create some thinking time for themselves is they create a gap between the statement and the question and they end up going, I go... Mm -hmm. Do you go? And you encourage them to kill that gap. Tell them, think of this as a five word sentence. Okay. I go, do you go? And say it like a five word sentence, but try to enunciate them as two separate statements. Madeline? Do you have them work on intonation? Because that seems a big part of this also in helping you keep it straight in your mind for, at least for me as a native speaker, to say, I go, do you go? Makes a big difference to say, I go, do you go? You go, does he go? He goes, if, does if, she go? if you feel that it will help them, um, mm -hmm. I try to show more than I tell. Uh -huh. And I try not to tell them, your pronunciation sucks, or not, not that you would, but um, I, I try not to tell them anything like, oh, no, that pronunciation is wrong. No, try to do this. Don't add the, the any in, more intonation more than the pronunciation is what I mean. But so I would try to intonate extra, mm -hmm. or I would tell them, try this. Or one trick that I do is I tell them that um, one difference between Japanese and English is that we have a melody in almost all of the sentences that we, that we say. And you listen to my melody. <laughs> and you just give them the melody and you tell them to remember that melody, to hum that melody, and then to bring that melody like, like a song to these lyrics. Hear the lyrics, now sing the lyrics to the melody. And I try not to get too much into like, oh, you've got to do this and you've got to stress down here. And just remember the melody instead and I hum it for them. And they seem to, to stick to that a little bit better. If I'm so inclined, mostly I'm just happy that they get the sequence. You can't ask for too much right away. Um, sure. you, you, you're about to give them new words. You're about to give them negative phrases. And to get too stuck on intonation, if, if they start thinking, oh, that's really important, but I've got to get it right every time, then they're not going to be able to focus on the other things that you'd really actually rather focus on. Alex? Um, yeah, when I'm doing a new pattern with uh, students, um, what I tend to do 
I don't know if it's because, because I can do it, is I tend to um, preview the, the target language with the, the rhythm. Like, do you go to school? Do you? And I've got, and like the desk that I have, I know exactly where I can sort of hit oh, it, that, make a boom right, noise. And it's like, do you go to school? Do you go to school? I go to school. Do you go to school? He goes to school. Does she go to school? And the kids and like Japanese kids are Excellent. hardwired to do. Mm, 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 they know mm. rhythm. They really can do it. And like, doesn't matter who they are, what level they are in the classroom, they can all do rhythm. And if you preview the rhythm, pre -view the rhythm <laughs> they are very likely to be able to follow it. And I've used that. I use that um, previewing from, um, you know, like Yo Chien upwards. Jose, I think you made a really good point about how um, giving them the melody first, mm. because I think the point is we we always remember song lyrics. Yeah. But um, something you read is harder to is harder to remember. Mm. So oftentimes, <clears throat> just like Alex was saying, and like you were saying, I will introduce the melody first, and I'll have the students all repeat back to me, to the point where they're all laughing at themselves because they sound so stupid. Yep. Yep. Mm. So I'll be like. Okay, everybody, with me. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Mm. Okay, because like I've got like one unit, like you know, um, what's your mother like? Da 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 da. Da 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 da. And what does your father look like? And da 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 da. And <laughs> kind of get them all doing that to the point where they're kind of like giggling. I'm like, okay, now these are the great. sentences that you yep. put on top of that. Yep. Yep. How it's, also help, it's also helping with the chunking. Yep. The chunking of yeah. Yeah. Getting them yeah. uh, in a correct. It but also once, light rhythm. once they've got the once they've got the rhythm, yeah, it's yeah. easier to lay the words down on top of it. Mm. It I also think. it also goes with my general theory that I want them to laugh at me, in the sense not that you know I'm I'm a buffoon, but that I well, laugh I don't with mind. you. Hopefully, they, they, at first it's <laughs> laughing at you, but then they realize they're laughing with you because they, hey, that's my mistake too. And they realize that you're not making fun of them for showing them their mistakes, that you're showing them why these mistakes are being made and how to repair them. Anyway, let's go on. Uh, so here's some examples of other sentences that, as soon as I hit the button here, that I can show you. Um, just very basic ones. So let your imagination go wild. Whatever is in the textbook that you've got to hit in the last 30 minutes, look at it and see how you can pluck it forward whatever verbs that they have to do or whatever tenses that they have to do. I study, do you study? I study English every day. I study English every day with my friends. I study English every day with my friends in my room. Or you can take any of those secondary or tertiary objects and move them around, whatever that you want to throw in there. I exercise, do you exercise? Uh, so throw that in because there's a lot of syllables there. And uh, then, um, you know, you can go back to the sentence before, then you can go back to longer sentences. Um, I think, do you think um, is really good to uh, open up a discussion class? Because I think, I don't think are um, really useful when you're doing um, discussions where you're, you know, you're making gambits. I think so, really, really basic uh, thing to say in terms of agreement. Okay, I believe that's true, et cetera, et cetera. So these are just examples. Eventually, once they've gotten used to the entire pronoun sequence and the question creation sequence, then you can simplify the blackboard and you don't have to litter it and spend, you know, literally a minute writing up, I go, do you go, you go, does he go? You can just write, you know, the simplified diagram of I, arrow down to they, and then the two um, sample sentences. So if you write, I don't think that's a good idea. Do you think that's a good idea? They know what that means when you're saying I to they, ready? And you, you point to somebody and you go, right? And here's a negative, and don't forget negatives, right? Um, don't forget, um, uh, um, oh, now I've forgotten the grammatical term for when, you, uh, when you're, you know, to be able to. I can't swim, can you swim? That sort of thing. I can eat natto, can you eat natto? Here's one that's always a favorite because they always, almost always manage to mangle this. I want something versus I want to eat something or I want to go somewhere. Um, pairing it as an auxiliary verb 
uh, with, uh, or pairing an auxiliary verb with want to express a desire to act as opposed to desire for an object. So here's, it is with a verb, and then you pair it up with an object, et cetera, et cetera. You can go nuts, right? Then you pair up the two of them. I want to eat ice cream. Okay, or you don't want to eat ice cream right now. You can go nuts. Um, let's see, and then we go to the future. There's a whole bunch of stuff here. And I also wanted to show you some of my blackboards from before, if I'm not mistaken. Oh yeah, um, I have, do you have, that's also a really basic verb that you want to make sure that they're good with, okay? Because eventually you get on to, uh, there's an example of have, I have Netflix on my phone. This is what's called a double variable conjugation. It's a double variable because it's I and my, and this is a mistake. That should say you and your, okay? Not you, my, of course. It's you, your. I have Netflix on my phone. Do you have Netflix on your phone? You have Netflix on your phone. Does he have Netflix on his phone? And it will screw these kids up royally because they had a hard enough time with the single variable um, statement in question. But to do a double variable, they have to, they, you can see them when you're about to say, ready, go. They start reviewing it in their heads. I, my, you, your, uh, he, his, uh, and then they get stuck at we. And then somebody says, our, our. Um, and then uh, there's all kinds of things, right? Uh, object pronouns. These are subject pronouns. You know, I'm going to show you an object pronoun later. Like, so, for example, Mary, uh, Aruga. Ignore this asterisk. That's for later. Okay. You want to try this? I have Netflix on my phone. Do you have Netflix on your phone? Ready? I can remember. <laughs> okay. Uh, I... uh, we'll, we'll go slow. This is what I literally tell my kids. It's okay. We'll go slow. We'll go slow. Okay. Okay. I have Netflix on my phone. Do you have Netflix on your phone? And you did a really cute thing too there. Usually it's me that starts, but you were so eager that you're the one that started. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's, it's, and I say, what a great student. And all the kids are laughing. Dee -dee -dee. And then and I say, I mean, I'm celebrating you and everyone's having a great time. Okay. So let's keep going. You have Netflix on your phone. Does he have Netflix on his phone? She, he has Netflix on his phone. Does she have Netflix on her phone? She has Netflix on her phone. Does it have Netflix on its phone? It has Netflix on its phone. Do, do we have Netflix on our phone? Good. And you can, it's already burning your brain. Could you imagine yeah. <laughs> what this is doing to a first year university student? Right? <laughs> nice. And um, you can do this in past tense. That asterisk becomes my shorthand for negative. So for example, Mary Uchida, let's do this in the negative. Ready? I think so. Okay. I don't have Netflix on my phone. Do you have Netflix on your phone? Um, you don't have Netflix on your phone. Do, does he have Netflix on his phone? He doesn't have Netflix on his phone. Does she have Netflix on her phone? She does not have Netflix on her phone. Does it have Netflix on its phone? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote it down. I'm you kidding. cheater. You <laughs> cheater. Okay. So there's the double, uh, there's a double variable. Okay. And uh, here's one that's like, it's basically a double variable, but because it's so out there, uh, it really screws kids up because it's my grandfather, my grandfather plays poker with me. Now it's poker because that's what was in the assigned text. You could make that tennis, you know, you could play, you could make that my, my grandfather cooks with me. Okay, whatever. But let's say uh, Kevin. Oh no, Kevin hasn't been here all this time. Uh, Catherine, Catherine, uh, ready to go on this? I hope so. Okay. My grandfather plays poker with me. Does your grandfather play poker with you? My grandfather. Uh, your, your, your. Your grandfather plays poker with you. Does your grandfather. No, nope, does his. Does, does his grandfather play poker with him? His grandfather plays poker with him. Does her grandfather play poker with her? His grandfather plays, her, her, her. her grandfather plays poker with her. Does its grandfather play poker with it? <laughs> I love it. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's hard, right? It's, it's hard. hard. Yeah. No, don't apologize. No, it's hard. The reason why I do this a lot when I'm, and this is why my, sometimes my presentations don't go so well, because I'm trying to do these demonstrations, because if you don't do it, you don't feel it. And if you don't feel it, you can't appreciate what the students are doing. And it's actually revealing for a lot of teachers who, for some of us, who are English teachers in Japan, have actually never 
tried to learn a second language, be it Spanish, German, or Japanese. And learning this new technique is kind of like going through the steps of learning a second language, because learning how to say English like this is almost like learning a second language. It's a, it's a completely different set of demands. So you could say my grandfather plays tennis with me. That's one way of getting around the whole poker thing. Then I have Netflix. Do you have Netflix? And here's a few more examples of these. Um, I like Marvel movies. The verb like plays a big part in taking the next step to um, free conversation. Structure control gives you the chance to guide what these kids are saying, but you want to make it more and more open. You give them lots of variation, lots of different sentences that they can completely comprehend from the very beginning, but they have trouble saying just because they're longer or they involve a lot of syllables in the verbs or a lot of L and R's that they understand, but they've just never said before. So you go from the basic conjugation of I like, then you bring it down to I like movies. Do you like movies with the simplified diagram so they can go as fast as they possibly can. And now at this point, this is basically subject verb object. So you tell them, hey, come on, you guys, let's just today, let's just target speed. Ready? I like movies. Do you like movies? You like movies. Does he like movies? He likes movies. Does she like movies? She likes movies. Does it like movies? And given enough practice, some of these kids can keep up with me. Now you're probably wondering, how did they do that? Well, just because they've spent hours at it. Then you start stretching it out a bit. I like watching movies at home. Do you like watching movies at home? And from here, do you like watching that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? There's nine syllables there. In my research and other research that's pointed to it, the kids that I have in first year and second year, to get up to, to the next level of fluency, they have to be able to say these eight or nine syllables in a row without any stops, without any uncontrolled repeats, without any ums or etos or anos, until you can say that they have smooth pace. Nine syllables is a big barrier. Most native speakers in their native language can go about 25 or 35 words like I did before. But if you're working on your second language, eight is the minimum for any kind of pace. Then the next level is whatever, 25 syllables. We work in words, they work in syllables. So being able to say, I like watching movies at home. Do you like watching movies at home? It's a huge challenge for these kids. But if they're not given the practice ground to do it in, um, how are they ever gonna learn? Any questions? I know I haven't answered any questions in the last little bit. And I'm not watching the chat. So um, if somebody sees a hand up in the chat, Alex, please tell me. Um yeah, I'd, I'd written a message to you. Oh, uh, I don't read the chat either. Okay, right. So <laughs> intellectually, we we can all process this, but I honestly think that it would be good for us to have a, a chance to um, thrash it out in a breakout room very, you wanna? very quickly. Yeah, Anybody sure. else? No, problem. no problem with me. Okay. Um, I will put you in pairs, which is where I usually put them in a, a physical classroom. Let's see. So here are the rules. You get into the room, whoever is in there first gets ready to do, and everybody write it down. I like watching movies at home. Okay. Do you like watching movies at home? And from there, it's the same pattern of I, you, he, she, it, we, they. Kevin, you're going to be okay with this? I, uh, I can act as a student. Good. <laughs> And actually, the student with you, the student, the person with you, will feel what it's like to deal with someone who's at a lower level or is at a different level of comp or maybe didn't come to last week's class. And this is where peer work is really, really helpful. It really, really helps me. These kids are actually teaching each other. When I say, ready, go, I don't have to teach each kid. They're teaching each other. Okay, everybody ready? You're muted, by the way. <laughs> you're muted, you're muted, you're muted, and you're muted. Just thought I'd warn you. Fun, fun, feedback. fun. Feedback, feedback. Fun. Difficult. Uh, uh, surprisingly difficult, I, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I cheated. I looked a bit. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's I why you are really smooth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Catherine, Madeline, specifically you, feedback or questions? Um, does it have to be about the breakout room? <laughs> so we we, you, we you can had... talk about the Stanley Cup playoffs, but I'm not <laughs> really what. 
Well, no, right before we went in, you said that you had taken something from the dialogue in the textbook. So I was yeah. wondering, um, I was under the impression that you just kind of did this for 90 minutes. Do you also have a textbook that you're using and doing other things? I say that only to like give you guys some grounding in what could be done. I normally I hate, yeah. I hate yeah. textbooks, but um, if you have a textbook, go for it. I have other materials that I bring into class for shadow talking. And to tie it into the shadow talking material, I take. I see, I see, I see. Sometimes. Okay, so you're. But I also to have my general idea that I want them to be able to do free conversation, mm -hmm. uh, right? right, Catherine? Right, right. Um, yeah, I think. I mean, this practice has been very good, and as I said, since my intention is to do this with face-to-face -face junior high school students, so I feel like I just have. I think I will have to practice myself to get the fluency down. But as you said, I mean, I have, a, I love, I love my junior high school students so much. They love me. I'll just say, I know that they love you. I know they love you too. They love me so much. And so we're, I can totally see we're going to have fun with this. Yeah. We're going to have okay. a great time. So we just did, I like watching. Didn't we do, I like watching. What did we just do, Bill? <laughs> I like watching movies at home. Thank you. So. Uh, I like watching movies at home. How about you? Gives them a chance to practice. I like watching movies at home, but with a slight variation. So it's not the same damn thing again um, in the breakout rooms. Then you pop this in there. I like going to the cinema. How about you? So now the variation isn't in the question. The variation is in the sentence. It's actually rather fortuitous that Alex asked me to send you guys into breakout rooms because I would actually like to send you into breakout rooms again with this sentence because the next sentence after this is what's called, you see down here, it's called MLR practice. This is where we're eventually gonna end up, okay? I like watching movies at home more than going to the cinema. So now we've got a higher level grammatical structure that you wanna practice. And you can team this up with a poll. Okay, who likes movies at home? Who likes going to cinema? And they'll raise hands and you say, well, okay, well, here you go. And then, and then you can make this as a negative. I don't like watching movies at home as much as going to cinema. Whatever you feel like, whatever you feel like they can handle. But um, this, we can either practice here or we can jump straight into here. Uh, what would you guys like to do? Go straight into M. But, and I haven't explained what MLR is, but would you like the shorter one or the longer one in the next breakout rooms? Nobody wants to do anything. <laughs> what's, the, what's the time? <laughs> if we got time to do both, I think we'll start with the shorter and then do the longer okay so here's the shorter one here's a longer one okay i got plenty of time to go to the shorter one if we just do it quick and then and then you know do it okay. again so this time it's only going to be a minute okay? okay i like going to the cinema how about you i like going to the cinema how about you S steve I are like you back it. steve's not back yet is he i like going to the steve is not back yet okay, okay. so then I'm going to keep the same rooms just for the ease of, um, ease of movement, okay? I'm going to keep the same rooms. Is that okay? That's uh, not a no, so we're going to go. Okay, uh, here we go. I put my hand up. <laughs> One minute, 10 second countdown. Bill says good to go and everyone's good to go. I like going to the cinema. How about you? Ready? Just so nobody embarrasses themselves. Yes, you are muted. Uh, feedback? Questions? It was hard. We, we oh, had trouble. <laughs> yeah, we had trouble too. Yeah. It's okay. It's now the nice thing about this is when I teach this to other teachers, now they can feel what their students feel. And they're feeling and they're feeling it at a different level. It isn't comprehension. You know, right. we, we can't hold that over our students anymore. This is a skill. And you now know what you're lacking and you now naturally start going through the process of figuring out what can I do to make myself better? That's probably what you need to teach your students to do as well. It isn't a matter of knowledge. You're much closer to being able to feel the need and the path for improvement as opposed to just thinking what don't they know as opposed to what can't they do. Um, okay, I was talking before about this acronym MLR, uh, which translates into mean length run. So let me um, 
ah, where's my, okay, I'll just stop this share, come back here. And I'll explain it from a different keynote that I have. And by the way, can you feel the difference between a white, dark text on a white background as opposed to light text on a dark green background? Can you feel that? Doesn't this hurt now after looking yes. at my, my green background? <laughs> And uh, actually, I wanted Alex to say a few words about this, but uh, first I'm going to kill that chair because that's making me hurt. Um, <laughs> Alex, what did you want to say about um, what um, uh, you helped me build with this, uh, with my blackboards? Um, yeah, I've been, uh, um, my special interest is any students at any level who uh, have uh, difficulty with um, reading or, or writing and they could be your students up the back in uh, lower level classrooms um, and uh, they're task avoidant. But what I've noticed, because I've worked at every level, I've noticed that everybody can read a blackboard. And I knew, already knew the evidence that, that uh, white backgrounds with black text are difficult for some readers, but blackboards are generally, it's a universal thing. And what I like about, um, what I like about the background go, that Jose has created is that it looks like a back blackboard and it's not perfect and i like the implicit thing that it's it's a function it's something that's being used and it's ongoing i like that kind of it gives that kind of a feeling of something that's in use and i haven't ever done that with mine mine is just completely just sort of dark green but i like the fact that that one looks like a board and um and white is the general color that I would pair with black with a with the green, and then I would use um, yellow as a highlight because that is the usual order that Japanese students are going to see used in a classroom. So the uh, the white will be the main whatever is the established language that they have, and then the yellow is usually used as a highlight. And um, he hasn't used he used to have red, but I on uh, she told, I told she me red. to stop that, so I did. Yeah. <laughs> Where was it? Where was um, it? Um, he was using red as a highlight, but um, I asked him to take it out because for people who have um, uh, people who have color vision anomaly, um, the most common problem is that the color red will disappear into a blackboard and never be seen again, and that's by about one in twelve people. Is, is the green blackboard better than the black blackboard? Um, I don't think it really matters. Okay. <laughs> you can go with the black. Um, that it's um, it's this it's a slightly softer mm. thing that you're looking for. You're not looking for crunchy black, if that makes sense. You know, like yep, the yep. black and yellow that you get of like warning signs, warning deer ahead type thing. It's you're looking for a slightly softer one, and that's why I quite like this because it looks um, it looks used. quite realistic. <laughs> it looks used, and it used yeah, and it's not perfect. It's allowing for functionality. Mm. That's my view. Is anyone using a cell phone right now? Is the lettering on this too small? Yes. Oh, it's, it's going to be, small. of course, too small. Everything yeah. is always too small on a cell phone. Okay. okay. Uh, but even on this big screen, this is still, still too small. Uh, mm -hmm. Jose and I had this discussion and he wants to keep the, the text the size that it is because of um, um, the way he wants his stuff to flow through. So mm. I would argue mm. that it's it's a few notches too small. It, it, I'm I'm trying to figure out a way to do it while I'm trying to hit my other targets, and I'm about mm. to explain one of those targets. But to do that, I have to go back to one of my old, and I'm embarrassed now to actually even show this because it really is painful on the eyes, right? So now you can feel it, right? Um, but MLR means mean length run. So the definition of a mean length run here is written. I explained it just before, but uh, we can work out to about 134 syllables before we say uh, something like that. Or um, we say ums or uhs. Uh, 25 or 35 words is about 134 syllables. But most of these kids, they have a hard time with eight syllables. Mm -hmm. But when you go from there to something like this, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 17 syllables. And they've been working at this for the past hour. They had, this is a compound sentence built from two simple sentences before. And um, just to make it easier from, on them, I transitioned them down to the simpler question, how about you? 
Now, of course, before I send them into any breakout rooms, I give them demonstrations, but this time I really do think I need to do a demonstration. So, um, Steve, you wanna try this with me? By the way, Alex, for example, I, I, you, look at, so, yeah. you look at Steve's background. What, what do you think of Steve's background? Um, yeah, that works for me. Okay. Yep, okay. that works for me. So, yeah. oh, I like the dog. Mm. Yeah, the dog, the dog was distractingly cute. Mm. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> Steve, you ready to go? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm not sure if I know what, what's happening here, but I'm, I'm, I'll try. Okay, well, it's the same pronoun um, conjugation, but instead of um, uh, the question, do you like watching movies at home more than going to the cinema? It's simply, how about you? How about him? How about her? How about it? Okay. How about us? Okay. So okay. here we go. I like watching movies at home more than going to the cinema. How about you? You like watching movies at home more than going to the cinema. How about him? He likes watching movies at home more than going to the cinema. How about her? She likes watching movies at home more than going to the cinema. How about it? See, now, Steve, quite naturally, being a native speaker, is quite fluent. However, some of you are going to find that this gets harder and harder the more that you practice, just because you start to stumble and you start becoming conscious of it. It's really interesting where you find yourself stumbling. But that's a demonstration. Now I would send them off into rooms. And I'll send you off into rooms unless someone else has a, another question. Going to recreate these now. I got 10 people, nine. So let's make four rooms. Got a few people here. Recreate. How does that look? So, Catherine, I'm going to move you up to. Room. Wait, what's our. I, it's, I like watching movies at home. Barbara. More than going to the cinema. How about you? Okay. I, I like watching movies at home more than going to the cinema. How about you? We good? Okay. Here we go. Anybody tired yet? <laughs> nah. <laughs> I could do this all night. Yeah, sure you could. <clears throat> I okay. get my chew, chew high and I will. <laughs> Actually, yeah, it's, uh, you're all quite welcome to start drinking. I, it's too I, high time. <laughs> I, 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 almost, I almost got more than just soda water uh, last time you guys went into breakout rooms. Okay, the, um, the only other thing that um, I want to leave with everybody, you can see where you can take this into variations depending on what you want to do, depending on what you want to teach, the vocabulary, the grammar that you want to teach, build short sentences up to the longer grammar that you want, um, break it down into, um, into something that can be conjugated and then reset as, um, as a, a statement question drill. And um, if, if you think that there's something that you think, oh, I'd like to do that, Jose, but I don't think I can do that for that, um, for that particular grammar structure. Tell me what the grammar structure is, and I can probably tell you how you could do something with it. So just as uh, something you can think about. And then you can take all those variations and you can use this as a warm up. Steve Payton is in here, but Steve Payton found that he, he had initially wanted to use this as, as a series of warm ups for his textbook that he wrote. But he found that it was so useful that it would created such momentum in the classroom. The kids enjoyed it so much that what he wanted to do for just 15 to 20 minutes turned into 30 or 40 minutes. And he decided to rewrite his entire textbook so that it was based entirely on this. And he wanted to make it more in line with the final goals that I have for what I normally do uh, when I have a 15 week class with kids. And depending on how high level or what low level these kids are, how remedial they might be in terms of needing to know conjugation versus basic question grammar or basic fluency. If they're fairly high level, I would jump into the conversational aspect of SCVC very, very quickly, like within three or four weeks and use things like, I like going to the cinema more than watching movies at home. By the way, you can also switch those two compound sentences around. That'll screw them up really good and um, go from there into building um, through a sequence called speed repeat information to free conversation. And it starts from here. You take the basic verb, 
I like, so it goes, I like English. Do you like English? You like English. Does he like English? He likes English. Does she like English? Let them get some confidence. Let them show, show them that last six weeks or the last four weeks of practice have given them uh, a degree of fluency that they can now, when they return to simpler sentences, really, you know, really uh, be proud of. Then you master the negative. I don't like English. Do you like English? I like English. Do you like English? One more time. Okay, get that really fast. Then you narrow it down to just I and you. Just I and you. I like English. Do you like English? 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 And you do kind of a bit of a, a role play in front of them, have some fun with it, and you tell them only this. But the goal here is to go very, very quickly. Then they go into uh, a round of that. And you tell them, okay, now I want you to double the answer. I like English. I like English. Do you like English? And you try to have fun with that. And also tell them that, um, by the way, I don't want you to just think of this as just a drill. If you want to be communicative, if you want to get whatever problems you might have in trying to convey a message, learn to repeat. Repeating is a very, very natural tactic to make sure that you're understood. Where is the real power in the sentence? When you say something once, like, chigaimasu. Or when you repeat it like this, chigao, 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 chigao. Where was that power? Where did it come from? It came from the repeat. Repeating is perfectly natural in any language. And when you're trying to be heard over um, a train coming into the station, okay, and you only have one chance because you're trying to catch your train at the, the next platform, you're going to say it twice to make sure that that person understood you. Next challenge, three times. I like English, I like English, I like English. Do you like English? Now you're trying to do it just for speed. And then you can do all kinds of things. Um, I try to time my class so that then this is the last exercise of the day. And we're doing this and I'm telling, okay, now, uh, what, partner A, close your eyes. And partner B, you can keep your eyes open. Ready, go. And they have to try to sense when the other person is, is starting and stopping while all of these other kids are sitting beside them. And, and when this big din and then they switch partners who have their eyes closed, they both close their eyes. Sometimes they pass paper balls while they're doing this and then when they drop the ball, they realize they can't handle the neural load uh, for saying this quickly, saying this fast and passing a paper ball to the next person. Oh, why is that there? Then we get on to what I call the switch. Okay, so we went from the original diagram, which was the three times above it, then I rewrite it so that then I take that word, either it's English or it's summer or it's sports, whatever was the base word in the object. And I rewrite the one below it and I say, I like new. And where new is written, that means that you have to come up with a new word that will fit as an object for the verb like. And anything is okay. Ice cream, sports, pizza, uh, Tokyo, whatever you want to say that will fit as an object. And then I take that three. Remember that number where it was written three? I scratch it out. And even though my handwriting is really bad, that's actually a question mark. And I tell them it's a question mark because now it's up to you how many times you repeat. It's up to you how many times you repeat because you can repeat as much as you want until you get the new word. But until you get the new word, do not stop. Do not lose your pace. Do not <coughs> try to do that. Just keep saying, I like summer. I like summer. I like summer. I like summer. I like baseball. I like baseball. I like baseball. Learn to repeat the new word because this is a very loud room. Neither you nor your partner can predict what the new word will be. And if you only say it once, you give them only one chance to hear it. That's not very kind of you. Say it twice. Say it three times at least. Read their face. When they understand it, they're going to look like they understand it. If you only say it once because you want to get this over with quickly, you're being selfish. Make sure that they understand it. Then you take that new word and you put it into the question. Do you like sports? Do you like Tokyo? The word Tokyo then becomes the new repeat word for the partner who has to answer. And that's the repeat word that they use until they can come up with their new word. So here, let me show you. I like summer. 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 I like Coca-Cola. I like Coca-Cola. I like Coca-Cola. Do you like Coca-Cola? 
Uh, I like Coca-Cola. 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 I like soccer. I like soccer. I like soccer. Do you like soccer? Which should be a sufficient demonstration. You and your imaginary friend. Then you go down to the student who's ready to do demonstration. Tell me, okay, you ready? Uh, Madeline, want to do this yep. with me? Sure. Ready? Okay. I like summer. I like summer. I like summer. I like summer. I like pizza. I like pizza. I like pizza. Do you like pizza? I like pizza. I like pizza. I like bowling. Do you like bowling? Okay. So you didn't repeat bowling. So uh, you, I, you're right. Size, right? So, I like bowling. I like bowling. Do you like bowling? I like bowling. 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 I like sports. I like sports. I like sports. Do you like sports? I like sports. I like sports. I like sports. Do you like Zoom? Do you like Zoom? Do you like Zoom? You did it again. You did it again. I did it again. I didn't. You repeated. But I asked. I asked the question three times. That's right. But I said, I like Zoom. I like Zoom. I like Zoom. Do you like Zoom? And in the one time is okay on the. Do you like one? Or you uh, can say it several times. You, you, can, you can say it several times, but the question should only be once. Okay. So you're emphasizing control. So there's a degree yep. of control here. Okay? But also in the demonstration, emphasize showing that a little light bulb went off over your head mm -hmm. while you were repeating the repeat word. You make it, make it really exaggerated. I like summer. I like summer. I like summer. I like summer. I like pizza. I like pizza. And you show that you thought of it while you were repeating then not until you were ready to switch out did you say that word. So you Got didn't it. panic. You were in complete control. You put in the new word when you wanted to. Then when you were done, you had complete control and asked the question only once like you were supposed to. Okay. Okay. Catherine, want to try? Sure. With the more difficult ones, I do two demonstrations. I like summer. 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 I like computers. I like computers. Do you like computers? I like computers. I like computers. I like computers. I like computers. I like my phone. I like my phone. I like my phone. Do you like your phone? Avoid those possessive pronouns. Okay. Because it's, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I'm sorry. If, if the kid says it, I wouldn't correct the kid, but as you as a teacher, avoid them because the kid goes, oh shit, I got to do that. Oh, oh shit. And then okay. they're going to like panic because like, oh shit, right? But that's not written up there. Or they might think, teacher, you got that wrong. That's not written up there when really it's okay to say that, right? So keep it down to the model that you have on the okay. blackboard. Okay. So here we go again. You guys are going to have a taste of pain. Any questions? Let's see, 10, 9, uh, Gonna keep these same rooms, okay? Just to make it easy. Mary, everybody, that's okay. I thought you were gonna raise your hand. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> I like pizza, I like pizza, I like potato chips, I like potato chips. Can't Do you like you. potato chips? Lost his voice. Bill. Am no. I muted? Okay. Well, no, oh, uh, Steve was talking, but he stopped. Okay, so I like pizza. I like pizza. What were you saying? Potato <laughs> chips. Oh, potato chips. I like potato chips. I like potato chips. I like potato chips. I like potato I like beer. I like beer. I like beer. Do you? You know, these are the sort of faces that I like to see coming out of breakout rooms. <laughs> but he's smiling, kind of giggling, looking a little tired, but obviously, you know. Oh, you know. My, my glasses, they don't have the cameras on, so that's a problem. <laughs> Hopefully when they come out. They'll... When we can have a discussion about that. Yeah, yeah. That's another whole can of worms, I know. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, oh Mary. I just wanted to point out what I did do at this level with my students who were like even elementary and we were on Zoom. And so I wanted to introduce this. And uh, instead of putting them into breakout rooms where I couldn't help them as they were discovering this, um, I did it as like a group of eight, nine, like what you have here. And I had them say another person's name. So it would be like, uh, I like dogs. I like dogs. I like dogs. Alex, do you like dogs? I like dogs. I like dogs. I like dogs. Um, uh, Bill, do you like bananas? 
I like banana. I like banana. No, you're doing it wrong. You're, you're doing, doing it wrong. wrong. You're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> I like bananas. I, just I like bananas. I like bananas. I like bananas. Do you like bananas, Bill? I like bananas. I like bananas. I like bananas. I like bananas. I like apples. I like apples. I like apples. Do you like appling? Uh, uh, Madeline, do you like apples? <laughs> yeah. Should we keep going? <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's, let's yeah. stop. Let's that's stop. enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I but I put the name at the first because that's what we often do um, when we are asking questions to a native person. Mm. Yes. Yeah. So we do, we um, do, but I could also imagine saying, um, have you seen my car keys, Mary? I could also imagine good. that. So. Mm -hmm. Being able to put the name at the end throws a little bit harder curveball, but whatever works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's just I did it because I didn't want to um, make them into the, put them into breakout rooms yet. You well, know, and no, I, think I wanted everybody to be oh, who's going to who are they going to call next? And because everybody's order of the room will be different, you couldn't do it like just. Ask the person on your left or ask the person above or below you. And so. I, I think that will work and it will keep up the tension in the room for the first few times that you do it. Mm -hmm. And it'll work for a room like this, which is what, what are we? Or eight, uh, eight participants plus a teacher mm -hmm. here right now. Um, but by the second or third time you do it, one of the other things that's good about SEVC in a physical classroom when you're paired, and I say ready, go, and there were two people flailing away at each other in every row. The actual, let's say man, a person hours of speaking is much higher because everybody is speaking. Whereas here, even though the tension is up because you could be called upon next, the actual amount of time spent speaking as opposed to spent listening and being tense, um, the ratio goes down in terms sure. of speaking hours. So depending on how, you know, maybe just today I want to do it as a round, but tomorrow we'll do more breakout rooms and maybe we'll do rounds and a breakout room today. It depends, you know, it's the synchronous world is a very different place. I know that I would encourage other teachers if this wasn't um, online, I would encourage them, no, just keep it to pairs, put them only as a group of three. You've got an odd number in the room, but then you're getting the speaking time really, really high up. But um, synchronous world is really different. And I'm but, glad that works for Mary. I'm actually probably going to be doing some of it myself. Okay. Well, the main thing is just everything we are doing now, we have to think, how can we do it on Zoom? Yeah. How can we take it Absolutely. online? So, yeah, that's why. Okay. Absolutely. Sorry. So, you would also practice, I don't, sorry, Catherine. I was going to say, so when you had an odd number, you have them in a three, you don't make this, you don't pair up? Okay, so. You have them you, go in a three, a triangle. Can you imagine, let's say I've got a class of 18 students, right? Mm -hmm. And here I am at the lectern, looking to the back of the room, mm -hmm. and in front of me are rows of desks and an aisle down the middle, okay? So I tell the kids, you saw that video, right, Catherine? Yeah. Okay. So I tell them to turn their chairs 90 degrees so they're facing each other, okay? Now, if there's an odd numbered kid, I tell them to go sit in the back so that there's naturally a group of three at the back. And then they just switch from there. But the group of three with the odd number is only at the back. Okay. Now, if I have a much larger class, if I have 36 students as opposed to just 20, then the one corner will be over there as an odd number. Got it. You then go on to, um, I don't like. I don't like summer. 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 I like winter. I like winter. I like winter. Do you like winter? It is enforced that the answer is in the negative. So even if I say I like winter, do you like winter? The answer has to be I don't like winter, whether you like winter or not. I tell them it's just a grammatical practice. Don't read yeah. anything into it. But you can have a lot of fun with it. Okay? You can have a lot of fun with it. Like, for example, let's see um, who would probably get this joke. Uh, Catherine, I'm going to call on you again. Okay. 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 Um, uh, Catherine, uh, so the, the, uh, I don't have a diagram for it, but it's the negative answer and a positive new word and a positive question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here we go. Okay. I don't like winter. 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 I like summer. I like summer. I like summer. Do you like summer? I don't like summer. I don't uh -huh. like summer. I don't oh. like summer. 
Uh-huh. I like snow. I like snow. I like snow. Do you like snow? I don't like snow. 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 I like English. I like English. I like English. Do you like English? I don't like English. 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 I like French. I like French. I like French. I like French. Do you like French? I love French. I'm just kidding. I do love French. Um, so you can have a lot of fun with that. I sometimes throw in things like um, uh, a really popular actor. Uh, and I say, I like this popular actor. And then I know a girl who actually really likes that popular actor now has to say that she doesn't like that popular actor. Really fun. Um, so you, you practice the negative. And then I'm going to show you the next diagram, which combines the practice that they just did with the positive and the negative. And it teaches them how to, again, practice their mean length runs. So at first, you can see here that there's a choice between and and but, because depending on how they choose whether to put a negative here or a neg, can you see my cursor, by the way? Mm. Okay, whether they intend to put a negative here or a negative there, okay, this is kind of an advanced thing because now they have full choice. Before I would enforce it and I would say, the, the, the first answer is a negative and the, um, the, an, the, the new word uses a positive, so it has to be but. Okay. Now let's switch that up, everybody. Okay, now all of it is negative, so it's and. I don't like winter. I don't like winter. I don't like winter. And I don't like snow. Do you like snow? So that's and because they're of the same like. But that doesn't mean it's just negatives. If you can, you can say, I like winter. I like winter. I like winter. And I like snow. But if they're of not the same like, if either one is a negative and a positive, then it has to be but. So now they, they get that as a chance to practice negatives matched with positives, positives matched with negatives. Okay. And then at a certain point, I tell them, now tell me the truth. Before I've been telling you that you have to say you don't like winter when actually you like it. Now I want you to tell me the truth. If you don't like winter, say you don't like winter. If you like winter, say you like winter. Your partner says they don't like winter, but you like winter? Well, they'll tell them the truth. You like winter. Now you're, you're starting to slowly release the, the structure control and telling them now you can tell the truth. So for example, Bill White. Oh. Yeah. You good with this dude? It means that you can say negatives and positives wherever you like. Okay. 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 I don't like summer. 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 I don't like summer, but I like summer vacation. I don't like summer, but I like summer vacation. I don't like summer, but I like summer vacation. Do you like summer vacation? I like summer vacation. I like summer vacation. I like summer vacation. I don't like fall vacation. I don't like fall vacation. I don't like fall vacation. I, I like summer vacation, but I don't like fall vacation. Do you like fall vacation? Okay, so just a couple of things. You came up with fall vacation as a simple sentence when mm-hmm. what I want you to do is actually come up with the new object uh, as uh, part yeah, of yeah. the compound sentence. Uh-huh. Which is fine, which is fine. You know, that was my fault because I'm accelerating the demonstration pace. Uh, if I had an accelerated demonstration pace, you probably would have naturally fallen into it. Yeah. But also, too, you demonstrated a tactic that a lot of students do. They go, I don't like summer. I like fall vacation. You stretched yeah. out, yeah. Yeah. which is fine, which is fine. But on, I would only show that as an advanced tactic. I wouldn't, sh- I wouldn't encourage them to start doing that. I want them to keep a specific pace and use repeating as the tactic right now to give themselves time to think. So just a a couple of little things. Oh, it's okay. Teacher's a bully. Teacher's a bully. You guys want to try this or, um, um, yeah, or I can just keep going because you probably know what it's like now. Okay. So let's just keep going. Uh, I don't need that. You know what? I'm just going to minimize that. So I'm back to share. And I hope I have the right, okay. And then you can start throwing in variations. And of course there are hundreds, dozens at least variations of saying what you like. But I I have a nice gradation from I love to I hate. And the line to the left in between the plus minus, the plus shows what is positive and minus. 
the line just shows them where a neutral feeling would be. And you can explain that I like very much, which is what VM stands for. Uh, when you say that as I like very much, that has a different r rating of strength than I don't like very much, which is actually a fairly tame way to say that you don't like something. But if you say I don't like by itself, that's actually stronger and hate becomes the strongest. You teach them to say I love, you teach them to say I love tennis, I love ice cream. They hesitate to say things like I love ice cream or I love dogs because to them, aishiteru hodo is not something that you say very easily uh, in Japanese, so they don't translate that very easily into French, uh, to French, into, uh, into English. I like a little bit. Try to tell them, please don't fall back into your old habits of saying, oh, tennisu, oh, rituraiku, rituraiku. And I literally make fun of it. Tell them, you will never talk like that again in front of me. I'm going to teach you this sentence. And if you fall back into your old bad habits, it's because, not because of me, but because you wanted to speak bad English. That is bad English. I'm teaching you the proper English. Remember it. And it usually gets the message across. So you tell them to where the, um, the asterisk is. Tell them that's the natural place to think that you can put in that variable. I don't like summer very much. I love summer. I like summer a little bit. Those are the things that you want to practice. You also encourage them. I know that I don't like summer very much is a very long thing to say, but for your own practice, throw it in, even though you actually do feel a little bit differently about it because it's good practice for you. Uh, there's the preferences. Then we start making this a little bit longer and we use a topic and the topic is my room. So we go to my room. I like my room. I like my room. I like my room. My room then becomes, and then you don't see this. I, do I have another slide that shows it? No, I don't. Okay, I don't have another slide. I was trying to prepare these really quickly this afternoon. But see there, a third one from the top where it goes, I like my room and but. From the and but, it would be the new word. I like my room and I like my sofa. I like my room and I like my sofa. And this is why it's important to practice the possessive pronoun or the possessive article, sorry, uh, before you put this in, because they have to be comfortable with my and your. Because uh, eventually it'll go from certain items that you're not sure that somebody has in their room, like I like my room, I like my room, I like my room, and I like my TV. I like my room, and I like my TV. Ignore that thing about the color, because that's, that's an advanced, um, that's an advanced uh, statement that's added on later. The question uses a different verb. It's, do you have? Not, do you like your TV? You can't make the assumption that this person has a TV. Some of these kids live in a dormitory, and they don't, literally don't have a TV in their room. So do you have a TV? I like my kitchen. Do you have a kitchen? I like my tatami. Do you have tatami? You tell them that uh, when it, the verb is have and the possession is um, what's uh, unconfirmed, then you have to say, do you have tatami? Not do you have my tatami or do you have your tatami, which sounds weird. You explain that these nuances are important. The answer to the question uses the same verb. I don't have tatami. I have tatami. I like tatami. I like I like my tatami. I like my tatami. I like my tatami. I like my tatami. I like my tatami and I like my sofa so on and so forth and so forth. Then you can insert um, information sentences. My sofa is red, my sofa is red, my sofa is red, my sofa is red. Do you have a sofa? Then from there, you can encourage them to say things like, my sofa is big, my sofa is red. You then, I, unfortunately I don't have all the slides, for, besides we're running out of time, the topic goes from my room to family. I like my family, I like my, I don't need this. I like my family, I like my family, I like my family, I like my family, and I love my sister. I like my family, and I love my sister. I like my family, I love my sister. My sister has a car. My sister has a car. My sister has a car. My sister's car is blue. My sister's car is blue. My sister's car is blue. I love my sister. Do you have a sister? I have a sister. I have a sister. I have a sister. I have a sister. I love my sister. I love my sister, and I love my brother. I love my sister and I love my brother. I love my sister and I love my brother. My brother has a fishing pole. My brother has a fishing pole. My brother's fishing pole is blue. My brother's fishing pole is blue. I love my brother. Do you have a brother? Et cetera. You review the vocabulary for niece, nephew, grandfather, grandmother, probably not necessary. grandfather, grandmother, 
um, great grandfather, brother in law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You review the vocabulary that you need to describe things around the room, to describe the sorts of things that a brother would own a baseball glove, an apron for your mother. You use character words. My mother is nice. My father is kind. My brother is stupid. My sister is smart. My sister is beautiful, et cetera, et cetera. You use all of these words and you start building up their ability to say what they want to say. And then you start saying, you know what? Let's just talk about family. And you'd be surprised if you scaffold it properly. If you give these kids lots of options and lots of confidence, when you say speak, they will speak. I'm, I'm cutting out a whole bunch of stuff, but that's because it, it takes hours to explain um, this kind of exercise. But if you let your imagination go, and if I get a chance to actually do a part two of this, I can tell you where this goes to the point where I say, okay, ready to have a conversation? Okay, ready, go. Mary? Oh, somebody got to go? Bye, whoever, whoever, who went? Oh. Mary, Mary. virtual logica. So questions. How much of your shadow reading um, is, is this, you pair it with shadow reading or I mean, are they codependent? Can you not have one without the other? Oh, well, you don't have to have them both, but I do about 15 minutes of, by the way, it's called shadow talking. Sorry, it's, sorry, it's, shadow talking. Shadow, right. shadow, shadowing Sh is another word for it. Shadow reading um, wouldn't make sense. <laughs> No, it wouldn't. I was thinking um, of the demonstration where she was reading the book and you were repeating after her. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the demonstration of how to do it. Right. Then do it. And then I would do that for about 10 minutes a class. And then we do a variation where I bring in an article. And, um, and this takes a long explanation too, but they're reading it for speed. So it's speed reading practice. Then we do some shadow talking, shadow talking while you're looking at the words. That whole warm up using shadow talking is about 15 minutes. Then we go into these fluency exercises. Yeah, so that, that breaks up the 90 minutes and you're not just doing this. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, it is a lot to ask. The kids are tired at the end of my class. You, you can see them when they finish my class, the ones who have pet bottles of orange juice or whatever in their bag go straight for it and like, chug down half the bottle because they've, they've been talking so much and they're, they're, they're just exhausted, but they look, you know, energized and they look, uh, they look relatively mm -hmm. happy with what they did. So my, my other question then was assessment. Mm -hmm. Do, do you, do you take a base test line or is just everybody you, you test them to whatever level. So if somebody comes in and they already, have a, an amount of fluency in somebody who has very low fluency. Um, do you, you just, if you reach a certain level, then that's fine. Or do you take a baseline and then how much they improve over the course of time, which would be a lot of work. I wouldn't imagine you'd do that. No, but I'm, 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 I'm wondering how you test okay. what assessment is there. Right. I, um, I would never take a, a baseline for each student because like you said, that is just a huge amount of work. However, I have been considering how to get more of something like that to give each individual a sense of their improvement. Right. And you could do something like that either by telling them how to do it at home and then um, how to do it in class, then maybe how to do it out of class. And um, maybe we have a few more minutes after I answer this question, I can tell you how to do that. But my current assessment system doesn't involve anything so elaborate and fluency, even though it's a big part of what I want to teach is actually a smaller part of what I have finally assessed for, because I'm not just teaching fluency, I'm teaching communication. And in communication, you're emphasizing other things like eye contact, um, the ability to get over communication problems, and something that I like to emphasize um, in, a very big in a very big way, which is their speaking style. And I, I encapsulate that into three words, your eyes, your voice, and your smile. Can I see your eyes? Are you showing your eyes when you're speaking? Are you, are you communicating with your eyes? Is your voice audible? Are you still mumbling? Are you still whispering? And you can say words like intonation and enunciation, but basically if I don't understand you, the problem isn't that I don't understand you, it's that the other students in the group with whom you've chosen to do this group test with can't understand you and they won't be able to have a, a really good conversation with you. Your smile, how do you appear? Are you nervous? Are you sitting there playing with your hair? Are you looking down? Uh, are you tr even trying to look like, you don't have to have a good time, but you gotta look like you're having a good time. Trust me, this is an important skill, just not just in English, but in Japanese, I tell them. How do you get over your communication problems? 
how do you uh, uh, make something understood when you don't have the grammar and I'm obviously not going to help you during the test. And I show them um, communication uh, workaround tactics. You got to show them what to do. And then also too, at the very bottom, because there are four categories, 25 points each for 100 points total. The final plus category is a speed and fun. Speed and fun being one category. So are you having fun? Are you guys having, trying to um, make jokes? You're trying to enjoy each other's company with the little grammar uh, knowledge that you have, with the little speed ability that you have. And are you trying to speak quickly? Or are you just sitting back in your chair, looking at your watch, waiting for the five minutes of the test to be over with? The basic structure of the test is they have to make groups of three or four. They can choose whoever they want in the class. Um, so choose wisely. Don't choose just because you think somebody got a good TOEIC score. Choose somebody that you can speak with well, somebody that you get along with well, someone that you know you can have a good conversation with. And you are given a lot of time in my classroom to practice these conversations. And the conversations are structured so they have to speak in two conversations, five minutes each. Uh, Japanese is forbidden. English only, so of course, no Chinese, no Korean, whatever your native language or other good second language is, you can speak only English. From the moment that I say ready, go, to the moment that I say stop, you have to keep up the conversation. Any gaps, any stops, um, that's also a penalty against speed because if nobody's talking, obviously speed falls to zero. Um, the topics of the conversation are from a list of 10. And the 10 is usually very, very everyday topics like sports, music, family, money, jobs, university, uh, boy, girl, friends. From those 10, for those two topics, you can choose the topic for your first conversation from those 10, and it's whatever your group wants. I have no say in it. Practice it all you want, polish it if you like, but remember, I want a natural conversation, no memorization. And then in the second conversation, same parameters, but I get to choose the topic. And I will not announce the topic until you've finished the first conversation. So you have to be ready. You have to be practiced on all of the other nine topics as well. Put all of your effort only into the one topic. Okay, but what are you going to do about the second topic? Because I can choose any from that test too. Brings a lot of naturalness and a lot of free flow to the conversation. And um, usually you can, if you emphasize it enough, don't memorize, don't try to speak from a script, don't try to do speeches. I can smell it from a mile away and you will be penalized. And usually they understand that and they can come up with some pretty natural conversations. Um, so those are the four categories where they can pick up points. And then there's a fifth category, Japanese, where I tell them anybody in your group of three, anybody in your group of four utters one single Japanese word, I will dock you five points from your total of 100. If you say, eto desu ne, eto desu ne, those are three words, that's 15 points, all of you lose 15 points. So in your practice, help each other. Some of you can't help but speak Japanese. So you practice against it. You're a team. A team tells the other team member when they're not going up the ice fast enough, when they're not passing the ball enough. You help each other in your practice and you can work this out. When a team member is telling you you're speaking too much Japanese, they're not bullying you, they're not being mean, they're trying to make your score go higher. Work this as a team and you guys will do very well. Did you watch my video actually, Madeline, in my uh, playlist for my conversation assessment? There's a video in there for my Maybe not, maybe I didn't get to that point. There's one in there. I and will I'll, watch it. And I will put it into the, um, the comments list for this event on OTJ as well too. Yeah, that's my assessment there. There are variations on that depending on how good the group is. Sometimes instead of making a cooperative group of four, I make a, a cooperative pair and another cooperative pair. And on test day, I have them face off in um, uh, a strong debate about a topic. So the topic is music. And pair A makes the first statement or pair B makes the first statement. Pair A basically has to go devil's advocate against whatever pair the first pair said even though they actually feel exactly the same way. We practice that all the time too. In, in, in a group that large of four, like in, in the initial one that you were talking about, do you have a problem with two people monopolizing the conversation and the other I two tell, not saying much? 
I tell them that's part of communication. Everybody has to participate. Actually, no, it's not part of communication. That's part of the first category, which is equal and natural conversation. So the first category is equal and natural conversation. Second category is style. Third category is quality of communication. And fourth category is speed and fun. Equal and natural means that uh, natural means no memorization and uh, no speeches, no, no set one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It has to be random order. And uh, if uh, some people aren't speaking, if two people monopolize the conversation, then obviously you guys are going to lose points because I'm going to tell you quite quickly, I expect out of five minutes that your natural speaking uh, quantity will be one minute and 15 seconds. So I might not put stopwatches on all of you, but I can tell who's not speaking. And I can tell that if you two said, hey, his English is really good. Let's just get him to make a speech. You two aren't speaking. Then you're all going to get 60. Everybody gets the same score. Everybody gets the same score. You guys got to work as a team. Yeah. Yep. And you do that once a semester? You don't do it like a midterm? Or I, 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 I've been it's thinking a little about hard, I would think, at the midterm. I, it is a little hard because they're not up to snuff in skill. Right. But you could do something like, I'm thinking about bringing in more vocabulary from Charlie Brown's NGSL or Young Learners or NGSL Academic, whatever. And maybe you could do a, a midterm on vocabulary and basically do like a, a speed test on um, vocabulary. But I don't know how to assess that yet. But I've never done a midterm and I've always put it just to um, the final test plus participation plus uh, basically, yeah, it's participation, uh, attendance as a negative factor, and the test. Yeah. And one last thing. I'm sorry, I've got lots of questions. No, 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 I, okay. After you, um, one of the other sessions, you talked about accounting, and I downloaded the Countess oh. app. And yeah. so how do you use that? Okay. I, I'm sure you told me before, and that's why I wanted it, and now I don't, and I don't remember Absolutely it. Absolutely no problem. So let me just go here so I can go to my settings with my backgrounds. And, oh, I haven't set them up on this computer. Oh, dang. Okay. So uh, it's okay. Uh, it'll take a minute. I'm, I might be able to do it later when other people are speaking. But basically, I have a, uh, a set of topics. Like, let's say, um, today it'll be money, cooking, and uh, vacation, okay? And uh, okay, uh, Catherine, uh, I roll the dice or whatever, draw a random number. So Catherine, your topic is vacation. Okay, 30 seconds, okay? You're gonna talk on vacation. And everybody else in the room has a copy of this software called, where are you, baby? I put, I, put, I rearranged my phone because I put in the new iOS and I don't remember where I put Countess. Um, Siri, where's the app count? Oh, hey Siri, where's the app Countess? Okay, so here's the app Countess, and this is free on the App Store. And you tap once, it'll count. So everybody else in the room has this free app. Catherine will speak, and everybody else is tapping along to the number of words that she says, and I'm keeping time. Usually a native speaker can speak something like, a native speaker will speak about 150, 140 words a minute. So it'll be like 70, 75 words in 30 seconds. One of my students will probably have a difficult time getting beyond 50 and probably somewhere a little bit above 40 for 30 seconds. Now, because everybody's doing it, everybody's paying attention and everybody's listening. So it's still a little bit of an effort for them. And it helps make sure that I don't make a mistake because we're going to take the average. Catherine does that in the first minute of the class. In the last minute of the class, she does it again or everybody does it again. They do it in breakout rooms as groups of four and they get their counts before and after class. I tell them to keep a running tally in their notebooks of week one, week two, week three of befores and afters. And it should make a nice, clean, rising sawtooth pattern all the way up to week 16. Well, that's like a, taking a baseline. They can see their improvement over the semester doing that. That's, so that could be your baseline count. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So th they're doing it within their, within their small groups, counting? Yeah. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Count, counting, counting, count, yeah. Count, counting count. the person who's talking and then they take turns talking yeah. and counting each other's things. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. C-O-U-N-T-S-S. -S. So Countess, App Store, Android version available. Yep. 
You can also get from the App Store or Android um, dice apps, free dice apps, which will like, you know, tap at the screen and it'll roll a, a six face die for you. And um, you get six topics and, um, you know, uh, okay, well, you get sports. I know you hate sports, but you got sports. <laughs> Sorry, that's the roll of the die. And then you just go on from there. Right? Sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> it, it is fun. It actually is fun. If you want to meet some of my uh, other students, Madeline's, on Tuesday mornings, um, I do a lot of these tactics with um, my experimental class on Tuesday mornings. You're always welcome, or anybody here is welcome to join me on Tuesday morning and come meet some of the students with whom I've um, sharpened these tactics for, uh, for class. Tuesdays a, today, one of the days I teach, but yes. <laughs> bummer. 10 a.m. on Tuesdays. Tell me if you want to join and uh, message me and I'll, I'll let you in. Um, My classes don't start until 10.55. So. Anybody else with questions? I was just thinking that um, this whole technique would work really well with my discussion class. And each week at the beginning of the class, we could do 10 or 15 minutes of uh, this kind of repetition on the topic of the day. Mm -hmm. So I like such and such. Do you like such and such? And and they could warm up uh, with opinion type repetitions to prepare them for the discussion. I wanna show you one more thing. Where did I put it? Uh, talk amongst yourselves for a second because uh, I realized I should have prepared this, but I, I didn't prepare it. So we're at 2019, 2020 files, KIT. Ah, here we go, we're getting closer, 2020. To C three C seven D seven D. Okay, here we go. Uh, so I'm going to take you back to one of my actual blackboards that I used last semester. I'm sorry, it's of the white variety, and yes, it's radioactive. But um, let's see. There it is. This is a really good one. Okay. Oops, not that one. Not that one. The, oh, there. There it is. Okay. So this is what I call word throw. Okay, very, very simple set of instructions. I say a word, you say a word. Then I say a word, but it has to be a different word from whatever anyone has said. You then have to say a brand new word and we keep doing this as high a pace as we can. Okay, so for example, Linda, you wanna do this with me? Okay. Okay, so any English word, but it always has to be a new word, okay? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna turn that off. It's, you don't need the diagram, okay, ready? Uh, fork. Spoon. Knife. Um, platter. Chicken. Meat. Uh, home plate. Um, baseball. Green. Vegetables. Now, what's happening is you're reacting yeah. to what, uh, the <laughs> word I'm saying, and you're creating a reaction to it, which has a limited viability. Right. Because eventually you're going to get tired, and we're both going to get tired. But what I did was I actually had an image in my head, but you caught yeah. on to the image right away when I said uh, fork and you went, I think with spoon or mm -hmm. knife or something, I was going to go with my whole kitchen theme. Uh -huh. So I encouraged them to actually have a theme in their heads from which they can draw an image and draw the vocabulary from there, uh -huh. which then trains them to have a message before they begin speaking, which is actually quite a limiting problem for these kids. They go into a conversation, they have nothing prepared to say. Without anything to say, I don't care how high your TOEIC score is, you're not gonna be able to say anything. Hey, Bill, thanks a lot, buddy. Good night, all. Good night, Good night bud. Okay, uh, uh, who, let's see, Bill goes out, he's eight, that's seven. So from there, you would double this up to two words. Uh, Steve, you good? Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. <clears throat> And the instructions are any two words. They do not have to be associated for meaning, associated for grammar. Uh, they can be of the same type, both adjectives, both nouns, whatever, just as long as they're both English words and they haven't been said yet in that pair. Ready? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yellow dog. Tater chip. Uh, big man. French fry. Small. Tiny. Dill pickle. Uh, man, woman. Dijon mustard. Camera, person. Heinz ketchup. Prime minister. Vice president. 
<laughs> starts getting tough, right? Starts getting tough for us. It becomes impossible for them after a while. You go from there. Then two words has a parameter. One has to be a verb. The other one can be anything you want. Okay. From there, they start saying things like, well, you probably said sister, study, play baseball. Really good. Nice. Keep going. But look at this. If you were to just take one more word, one more word, whatever is missing out of a subject, verb, object, string, you would have a sentence. So yeah, you were saying sister study, your sister studies history. But if you say sister study history, I still understand you. But you know, we've been practicing this. You say my sister studies history. You put an I in front of play baseball. You get I play baseball. You've got a sentence. You can speak in sentences. The hardest part is to come up with the one keyword of baseball, then the associated verb that you know is play, then the associated subject, which is of course yourself. You can speak in sentences. You don't need to speak with single words. So the throw becomes sentences. One sentence for another sentence, one sentence for another sentence. Then the sentences go up. Uh, first, you give them a topic. Then you tell them, now two sentences. And other topics could be music, Japan, high school, money. So all of the sentences are associated with those topics. Then from there, okay, you can do speaking terms. This is actually designed to create um, uh, um, mini speeches. But you could take that from there and start saying, okay, two sentences. Now, uh, two sentences plus a question. The two sentences with take out the question. And then you just, in the demonstrations, you start free flowing. And then they get the taken free flow. And then you change the topic. And then you find yourself actually just in regular conversations with these kids when only just 30 minutes ago, all they could say was one word to each other. They just show them the path to actually using the rules that they have in their heads. They can start adapting to it very, very quickly. Single word, double word, parameter of a verb. Okay. Then you go to topics. Then you show that it's not that far from a subject, verb, object, triple word <coughs> sentence. And then you say two sentences per person. And then you just keep going from there. And that would be perfect for, I was remembering this because Linda said that um, this is a warm up to a discussion class. And you could use it directly from word to word, parameter pair, and then um, subject, I'm um, sorry, sentence throw. Then, okay, let's have a natural discussion, everybody. Right. Catherine, anything from you? You're good? I'm good. This has all been really helpful. Like I said, it's my whole first my ideas for junior high school that I feel that I'm, yeah, luckily I don't actually, I do have to assess them, but the assessment's very, they just get, hey, Joe 10 from me. So I don't have, a lot of things I don't have to worry about with them. Stick with the assessment you had before and just sort of aim this up towards that. Give yourself enough time at the end to cover whatever it else that you need for your actual assessment. Um, but then just try to get them to merge and then more and more every semester merge more and more towards your assessment or make your assessment a bit more like a conversational one. And um, eventually it'll come through. Catherine, you've seen my, my demonstration class playlist, eh? Yes. Good. Okay. Mallory, question from you or Alex, anything else? Mallory? No? You opened your um. mic. Yeah, um, it was more like a question because I used to do uh, drills uh, in my classes too, but very diff in a very different way, and I haven't been able to adapt it for um, yeah for online classes in the first semester. But yeah, this. Uh, yeah, it gave me an idea, but just I was more like thinking of changing always the object. Mm -hmm. And do you think it would be too difficult online or like? The difficulty comes 
in my experience online, remember, I only have as much experience as, as you when it comes to the online experience. It's 15 weeks, basically. The difficulty, difficulty comes from not demonstrating enough. You demonstrate mm -hmm. lots, you give them lots of time to figure it out, you give them lots of pairs, you, you, you give them lots of, of compliments, say, oh man, that was really good, but you wanna remember this, but that was really good. And okay, uh, Taro, your turn. Uh, Taro, good, but you can go faster. No, you can go faster. Okay, uh, Kyoka, your turn. Oh, no, that was good, everybody. Did you see Kyoka? Oh, that man, that was good. Okay, everybody, go into breakout rooms. Ready, go. Lots of compliments, lots of demonstrations. Um, don't give them any more than they think they can handle. Try to keep it the same level with different variations using different verbs until you get to the next grammar level that you want to mm. throw in. Remember, it's a skill. It's not knowledge. Yeah. Steve, what are you thinking? You do, you do lots of speaking already, right? Uh, yeah, I do a lot of speaking. I think I, I like this because I like the speed aspect of the idea. And the fact on uh, focusing the students to, to increase their speaking speed, I really like that. Um, I do a lot of conversation in my classroom. And I think, certainly, I think my students could benefit from uh, this, kind of, this kind of practice before their conversations. Because I think I've mentioned before, like I start every Monday morning class or every, or every Monday class with uh, the simple, how was your weekend? Where did you go? What did you do? Where mm -hmm. I put them in pairs and have them have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I had them, you know, first do a run with that somehow using this methodology um, to kind of, I took her for a walk just, just like 10 minutes ago. Um, sorry. Um, she just wants to play. That's all. Um, so, yeah, I think my students benefit from it. That's <laughs> essentially what I'm trying to say. Yeah, Sorry. That's cool, man. It's cool, it's cool, it's cool, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, you, your students, if they're already at that level, could probably benefit a bit from seeing where they went on their, like Madeline says, their baseline to the end of the class using Countess and, um, you know, seeing that they actually moved up. I saw that, I looked at Countess, and I, I put the link in there just, just before Bill left, but... Um, um, I see the Countess does have a 99 cent uh, um, pay option. Yeah. Is there a count limit? Is that what it is? You break the count limit? Like, There's uh, no count limit, but what you can do is you can keep counts. So you can ah, save so you this a count and you can go count something else, which is totally not necessary for what I do. So I so tell you them, count, just get like, the free version. It's two, fine. You can count two things at once? Ten, I think like hundreds of things at once. If you want, but I don't know why. You oh, okay. Do so can you label them like, like glasses of water I've had today and push-ups I've done today? And maybe, I don't know. I've never paid for it. So maybe you can. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But all, right. all I need it for is to tell the kids, okay, this person count this person. Okay. Next person clear, get ready. to. Yeah. Count. No, I don't, yeah. I wouldn't ask the kids to pay even a hundred yen for something like that. Yeah. One of the nice things about SCVC is that I, would have exactly that same problem. I always did until I actually turned to SCVC. But when you've got this going and you've got a good rhythm in the class, there really isn't any time to speak any Japanese mm -hmm. in the classroom because I, I tell them, don't talk when I talk. That is an affront to me, that is rude. Okay, I'm explaining this to you, so shut up. So they can't talk when I'm talking. When, when I say ready, go, they have to do the, uh, to do the drill. And yeah, you hear a couple snippets of Japanese here and there, but my limit is when uh, they're, they're not speaking Japanese to help the assignment go forward. Some kid doesn't know a word. Some kid doesn't know uh, what to do in this particular thing. And the other one is helping them in Japanese. Yeah, I'll, I'll turn a blind eye to that. But when they're talking about nail polish or when they're talking about, you know, buying new soccer shoes, yeah, then I'll do something about that. But generally, they don't have time. They don't have any time yeah. to sleep. They don't have any time to play with their phones. And I'm talking about a physical classroom. Now, of course, the online world is very different. But if you bring this into the physical classroom, whenever we get back there, either in April or in October next year, you're going to find what I find. This, this really does do really, really good things for how your classroom goes. Once we get back to physical classrooms, that I can attest. And it hasn't yeah, been that bad at all in uh, online. I'm sorry. I, start I, 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 start, I started speaking when you were speaking, and I know that's an affront to you. I, I, I apologize. <laughs> Linda. I, I start back in the physical classroom on Wednesday. Oh. And my Friday classes, I have 35 students in 
each class and they're not allowed to speak to each other. So we won't be able to do anything like this. Yeah, that's too bad. I don't Literally, know how you can have a conversation class without allowing the students to speak. Uh, are they allowed to speak at all? They just can't speak. Uh, they can speak one at a time. Then maybe can, count us. Maybe do a bit of count us with them. Okay. Maybe I don't do know a, how I could. I don't understand how I could do that. Very well, much. Download the app. Okay. Mm -hmm. Break them into groups of larger groups, groups of. No, they have to sit in their chairs. They can't move around. No. Oh shit. And they're they're at least two meters apart from each other. Or well, I would guess. Well, that maybe. definitely encourages them, encourage them to speak in larger voices. Mm -hmm. Bye, Alex. Thanks a lot. Oh, who's going? Who's that? Who? Somebody. Alex. Tell me. Alex is raising her hand. Oh, Alex says... Oh, raising her hand. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I actually went through a solution for that, pro, for that issue about uh -huh. uh, students sitting in rows. So they're not allowed to move. You're allowed, not allowed to have um, uh, alternates, etc. So you, um, you can do the... But they, and they basically, they all have to place forward. Right. But... There's nothing stopping you say, okay, we're in the room, we've got row A, row B, row C, row D, row E, whatever. Got that right. Okay, um, row A, you're going to ask a question. Row C, you're going to answer. Row B, you're going to ask a question. Row D, you're going to answer. And they can do that. You can do that at the same time. But they're not allowed to speak loudly. Yeah, we went through that, that too. expels the virus. Mm. Well, we did that too. So they had to... We had to explain to, um, this was in junior high and elementary, we had to explain to them, okay, you are no longer allowed to spontaneously use your, your other voices. You're going to have to be using somewhere between a library voice and a um, talking to a, someone near you. So you have to listen more carefully. But if, you're, um, but if, you're, if you've got something that you want them to practice, um, you've got to set, you know, like say the yes, please, SCVC. 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 Um, there's no reason why you can't have one have one row um, rows A, A, C, and E ask a question, and then the rows in between answer in a quiet voice. That's a good idea. And that's and then you just alternate it. They'll all be wearing masks. Yeah, so that's fine. They're actually answering or not. I've I've been I've been teaching face to face since the beginning of June. And this is the situation we've been we've mm -hmm. been dealt. So, well, that's a good idea. I like that. So, mm -hmm. I, I hope both. I hope all of you. I hope all of you come to um, another event I'm doing next Saturday. I think it'll end up being for hybrid classes because this is the kind of information we need to get to each other for people who are working. What time on Saturday? Haven't decided because it's still in the middle of the polling, but uh, it'll probably ah. be probably about this time, seven o'clock, maybe six o'clock on Saturday, and it's for information like this. You know. Mm. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, yeah. When you normally put them into pair work, like you would normally drill something with a group, and then when you normally put them into pair work, you just put them into 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 row work, and everybody faces forward. It's not very natural, but it's and everybody's speaking at the same time. Yeah, so you're doing it at the same. Yeah, mm. so and you've got to be at sort of, um, you know, you have to use some sort of like symbols, you know, hand gestures or something. Go oral recitation kind of thing yeah yeah except you yeah. can do question and answer using this kind of uh, using these drills you can you can be, do this question and answer stuff perfectly also linda do they have wi-fi in the room no oh crap <laughs> at my university i was too. just really <laughs> disgusted the room i was in last semester that i never went to because of you know online um it had wi-fi but the room i'll be in this time does not. At least mm. if they had Wi-Fi, they could use their phones to do something in terms of chat. Oh, the school's Wi-Fi would just crash if everybody like, used it at once. I, I, why? Oh, it just makes you tear your hair out, you know? Yeah. yeah. It just makes you tear your hair out. The, the, the stupidity of my university. Of course, nobody had the foresight to see a pandemic coming, but 
for, for years, they were being told, you got to get Wi-Fi into those classrooms. And for some reason, what they instead did was invest hun hundreds of thousands of yen into those chip readers with the IC cards inside oh, yeah. their ID, ID cards. So they, they got chip readers to do attendance, which nobody right. pays attention to, and the kids cheat it every time. Right. So they paid 700,000. Or, or maybe millions of yen to get those things in every room when right. they could have spent half that and got Wi-Fi into every room. Now we got those chip readers do, sitting there doing nothing in those rooms. Yeah. Ready to be cheated on. And I, I haven't uh, been part of that yet, but I'm told that students will give their friend their card and their friend will sure, sure, sure. Of course. mount their attendance. And, sure. and, um, or they'll say, if the student's late, they'll just tell the teacher, I forgot my card. Yeah. And the teacher will count them as yeah. being there. Well, we, we have those chip readers. And they have the, from the first year students last year, they were supposed to mandatorily log in. Mm -hmm. But the teachers aren't allowed to access that data. Yeah. Isn't that insane? <laughs> anyway, uh, let's stop with the bitch <laughs> session. Um, yeah. <laughs> SCVC, we've been at it two and a half hours. If no one has any more questions, I'm going to get a drink. <laughs> <laughs> so you all are, are quite free to do what you But um, stay in touch with me. And you come up with any other questions, yeah, I'm always free. I thank hope thank you, you so much. Follow-up session. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, would, yeah. I would be happy to, actually. Maybe, I don't know, sometime after Jolt is finished, maybe around um, Sounds good. the start of December, because then you guys will have all kinds of questions from trying it. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. More ideas from more weeks in the class, in the online classroom myself, and maybe we can have some fresh things to say. Great. Okay. I will have these um, keynote slides. And um, from Keynote, if you have Keynote, you can turn them into PowerPoint. If you don't have a Mac, I will make a PowerPoint version of these Alex Burke approved slides and they will be up uh, to download uh, from Beautiful, the Beautiful, yes. So, I think thank, thank Microsoft you so much. can open the Keynote slides. Great, so choose whichever you like. I'll give you links to both of them. Awesome, thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, and Thanks. by the way, my videos on YouTube, play them all you want. They're completely um, copyright free. They're uh, creative comments, so play them all you want, copy them all you want. Okay. okay. Thank yes. you. Okay. Right, thank, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Jose. Bye-bye.